We are Myth Vision. Welcome back to Myth Vision Podcast. As you guys know, Derek is moving. He's moving to the, the state of Washington. So he wanted to do something special for the for the people, for the for the fans. It's gonna be a uh free for all. Everybody can jump in. I'm gonna give the link. Um, here's the link right now. Before I do that, though, I, Dr. Amon's here. And uh, what's going on, man? Not much. Thanks for having me on today. I appreciate it. Yeah, just before I give out the link, I just want to let everybody know that Dr. Amon has started a channel. A brand new channel, Lady Babylon. This is a classicist, PhD in classicism. Is that what it is? Classics, yeah. Classical philology. Yeah. So he's out to start making videos, and uh, you don't want to miss that. You don't want to miss that. And, you know, I just wanted to get that out there. But with that being said, this is going to be an open chat. This is not about me. Uh, this is about everybody. So this is – I hope you guys can see that link. Let me just make sure it's there. Yeah, that link is – you guys can see that link. Okay, good. Yeah, the link is there. And let's let's do this thing. The super Chats are going to Derek, who needs it right now. He's uh, got a lot of funds, so it would help him out. And uh, whoever sends a Super Chat, that, that skips everybody. Whoever's talking gets cut off. I read the Super Chat first. So and to keep that in mind, whoever has a super chat, throw that out there and you get to cut the line. You get to you get to cut off whoever's speaking because you paid. You get to have your voice heard, ask questions. Dr. Amon might know some some of this stuff. I'll guess, even though I'm not an expert, I can I can always try to guess and give you my opinion on things. But, you know, hey, we're just having fun. That's all. What's going on? So what's going on, Doctor? I mean, when, you, when is your first video going to drop? Oh yeah, it'll be a couple more days now. Yeah, I'm I'm working on short videos that I want to give people a real slice of the underbelly of antiquity. I mean, I just want to I'm digging into the deepest, darkest recesses, pulling out uh, references that you know typically your average classicist, your average prof would uh, would say, "Hey, uh, this is too hot for me." I can't do this because it says stuff in it that might offend somebody. So I'm looking for all that stuff. And I'm going deep diving into the religion, into the deep things of Satan, it's called. So, um, wow. yeah, yeah. So that that's going to be the first video, the deep things of Satan. Yeah, it is. It's going to be it's going to tell us all about the cup, the cup of the pornea. Yeah, no, good stuff. Good stuff. And I promise they'll be short because I know people's time is valuable. And, you know, I, I don't want to throw out there something that, you know, I'm not looking for a following and I'm not looking to sell books. I just want people to, to be able to interact with this material and say, yeah. oh, my God, do you, hear what, do you hear what that guy said about those drugs that they were putting there, you know, and how'd they get them yeah. up there? You know what I mean? Yeah. So I was thinking while waiting for some people to jump in, waiting for some super chats to pop up, I was thinking I'm going to give my my two cents on why I stopped being a Christian. I haven't talked about this in a while. It's been a little while since I actually got into this subject because as somebody who was down on hard times in life, who found Christianity through reading the text and thinking this was, this was speaking to me, this parable of the, of the son who went out and spent all of his inheritance in foreign lands on, on prostitutes and, and drinking and gambling and, and uh, he's down on his luck and not, he finds himself working on a, in a farm, eating with the pigs, eating the same food as the pigs were. Right. And then he realizes that he can just go home. He could go home and his father will give him a job and he'll be in a better spot than he was now. So he goes back. The father is so gr grateful for the return of the good son or for, of the bad son. The good son, who was never left, he always was there the whole time. He didn't screw up his, screw up his money. He's been working hard his whole time. He's like, why are we throwing a party for this son who was gone and spent his inheritance and come back? I did the right thing the whole time. And the father's like, but this is different. This is this is somebody who had, who is basically born again, right? This is this is something to celebrate because this is somebody coming back from death. Now, hearing parables like that. 
I remember being like, this is speaking to me. This is real divine wisdom. And so I got hooked into Christianity. Long story short, I started studying, you know, the, I started listening, I started watching, you know, Bart Ehrman, reading books, like even getting Richard Carrier. I got into mythicism for a while. Long story short, I started to realize that if all of these miracles that are claimed to have happened did actually happen, let's say he fed 5,000 people with two fish, that's a big claim. You would think someone like Philo, who's writing in the time of Caligula in the 40s and 50s, 40, late 40s up into the year 50, you would think he would remember something like that. You would think Pliny the Elder, who's traveling around in the 60s and even in the mid early 70s, who's writing a, a world history, you would think he would, who he's talking to the Nazarenes, he mentions the Nazarenes, he mentions the Essenes, he mentions prodigal births, he's mentioned all these types of, you would think that you would remember something like this. So I actually got into mythicism because of that, because I was like, there's no evidence this person actually lived. And then I started to think about that more often. I started realizing, well, just because we don't have the evidence that from these contemporary authors doesn't mean the guy actually didn't exist. And the biggest question for me to get out of mythicism and back to just a regular mainstream scholarship I, mindset, I guess, whatever you want to call that, I started to think like, when did it go from being a myth to people thinking it was a person? Like, what? how do we not know? We can't put our finger on it. It doesn't, there's nobody really contesting this thing. I think there might have really was a guy. But anyways, Captain Deadpool, what's going on, buddy? You're the first oh, person ready. oh, okay, you're good. There is a uh, super chat. At the same time you popped in, a super chat popped up. So I did say I would read them as soon as they came in. I'm Stop lucky scaring. like that. Yeah. <laughs> Stop scaring, man. Derek's not here. You've got the helm. Time for a palace coop? <laughs> I guess. I guess that's if that's what you want to call it. Yeah. Oh. So Is my audio okay? Yeah, it sounds pretty good. How's it going? Okay. I thought I heard an echo. I want to make sure it wasn't me. It, it's it's I yeah, it's not bad. But um, yeah, man. How you what's you been up to? What what's you, what do you got going on here? Oh, uh, uh, not a whole lot. My kids just went back to school today, and I'm I've been planning on making more longer form content on YouTube. Oh, nice. Uh, so I've been working on figuring out how exactly I'm gonna be recording those videos and how I'm gonna script them out and just trying to figure out what my what all my format to look like and all that. Yeah. But I'm um, Adam Jim. Yeah. You you you're big on TikTok too, right? Yeah, I got ish. I got almost half a million followers. Wow. I guess I, mean, I might I might I might jump on there and try to try to play around with TikTok, see what happens. Yeah. I don't feel like I have the time for it, but I feel like I probably should just at least try it. You could try it. I don't know if it's worth it. It's, it's not for everybody. Yeah. Are you a uh, are you a former Christian or some kind of apostate or Satanist, Deadpool? Yeah, yeah, well, all the above, all the above. <laughs> um, no, uh, yeah, I was a really devout Christian for about fifteen years. I was a charismatic Pentecostal, and I went to Bible college and got. I wanted to be a Bible scholar, and I graduated and became an atheist after that. So uh, now, now I have a useless degree and uh, one day I made a video on TikTok talking about my deconversion and. That's pretty much what started it all. Uh, that went viral, and now I make. I've been making educational content on there for almost two years now. Nice. Um, so what yeah. was the one thing that pushed you that pushed you over the edge? What was the one thing that pushed you over the edge? Oh, it was a lot of things. A big one was um, the gospels not being written by eyewitnesses. That was a big Shit. one for me. Um, because in the, the church I grew up in, it was told us, you know, these are four independent eyewitnesses. Oh, they still say that. Yeah, yeah, they still do. They just ignore the scholarship. They just say, no, nah, it's yeah. not true. Matthew wrote it. Luke it's wrote nuts. it. We, we know nuts. it's true. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So like once I heard that, that was like, okay, I, I, I can't trust that. How am I going to like bank my entire life on these four books that are copying each other essentially and coming up with their own? Uh, theology and borrowing theology from other people, maybe Paul uh, and others. You know, like this, just and they're written, you know, decades after the, the events. And like these, this, this, you'd be, you'd have to be crazy to base your entire life off of this sketchy of a text. And we haven't even gotten into how they were changed and what was added to them and taken from them. Uh, so yeah, I was like, this, this doesn't make sense. Um, Jesus was 
started to look more and more like just a, a failed apocalyptic preacher. Uh, Paul started to look more and more like he was someone that just took Jesus and like ran with it. Yeah. And started doing his own thing. Uh, no, Israel so, uncovered. Thank you for that super chat. Forgot to mention that. Just want to throw it out there, but. Yeah, but so you, one thing you ever dabbled with mythicism at all? Have you ever dabbled with the thought of this? I, maybe I did. I used to, I never fully committed to it. Uh, yeah. This was about a year and a half ago, I guess. I used to jokingly call myself an all the fencesist. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I, I, I toyed with that idea for a while. I, I got Dr. Carrier's book on my uh, desk uh, or shelf. I read that whole thing, and and eventually the the arguments just didn't do it for me. And I, start looking more into like okay what does Bart Ehrman have to say about those guys like that what? I was like yeah I, I can't get behind some of the claims of mythicism well I mean even just like some of the some of the claims like Paul's Paul's language being ambiguous but Paul yeah. mentions the there's a event where he actually breaks bread and gives him wine he mentions the Eucharist yeah. event happening in a real place and then he talks about Kephas and he he's mentioning real yeah. people like yeah, if, this was all, if this was all just mythological it would there would be no Kephas there would be no him giving himself up mm -hmm. and getting you know what I mean I'm, I'm trying to think what the actual um the actual yeah. Greek was, but yeah Paul, I mean, Paul mentions he was born of a woman and he said um uh, yeah at Jesus who who once was flesh uh we no longer know as flesh like he says I think it's something like that so yeah he like, says and he says, you know, Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures. And then he was buried and then raised in the third day. And then he appeared to Kephas. And before that, he says, oh, on the night that he was handed over, took a loaf of bread, gave thanks and, and said, this is my body. Who is he talking to? And how, yeah. where, where, where are we quoting from? This is all in, in his and in I, Paul's head. Like he's just making this up. Yeah. And, I guess and he's writing. It doesn't seem likely. And he's writing these letters to entire congregations of churches. They were probably very small, but he's still writing these two. He's not writing down his own ideas and keeping it to himself. And we just discovered them later. Like he's writing right. two people, uh, you know, who are who interpreting these, who are yeah. interpreting this real stuff. Yeah, exactly. Right. Like he, none, nothing in the language that he uses suggests that this shit happened in the, the firmament or or whatever. Well, no, what you just said is that what you said is really important because if that's what his intentions were in his language. He, he it would get interpreted that way by the churches yeah. that he's writing to. So there'd be other people saying that this, this didn't all happen in real life, but nobody interprets that way. So I think, I think for me, if, if there was people early on contesting that this actually happened or people who are even just like straight up mythicist Christians, then I probably would, that would be a strong case, but yeah. I don't, I don't know. It's just, it's possible, but I just don't think it's the most likely scenario. Yeah, I'm not and, saying and, it's impossible, you know what I mean? Yeah, and then, and then you got um, Kel, uh, who was it that wrote Contra Celsus? Um, uh, Irenaeus, right? Or not, Irenaeus, um, yes. uh, yeah, I think it was. Is it Origin yeah. or Irenaeus? I, I yeah. think it was Origin actually. Okay, Origin. Yeah. So he wrote Contra Celsus against Celsus, and it was a a, a scathing no, it wasn't anyway, he, he, he was rebuking um. The Kelsus. claims of Celsus. Yeah. And Celsus was like, was making fun. Yeah, it was Origin. Sorry. Yeah. He, he's making fun of Christians for worshiping a, like a lay person, like a day laborer who was killed. Like he was making fun of them for yeah. worshiping. And then he them. even like, mentions the woman too. He goes, yeah. you guys, you guys are going to say that a, a woman saw him resurrected. You're going to believe her. Yeah. Like he's talking about real people. He's not talking yeah. about, oh, you believe that myth. That's crazy. He's talking about real stuff. Yeah. And this is a hostile witness. So I don't know. You know, I like to talk about this is a good subject. But anyways, we got a super chat. Logan Fisher. Thank you. For, super chat. for Derek, we are myth vision question for anyone. I heard Jesus was most likely nailed through the wrist, not the hands. Any archaeology to back that up? I don't think so. Unless someone knows something that I unless I've been living under a rock. But as far as I know, there's zero archaeology for something about the crucifixion right sorry i got distracted <laughs> well, yeah, the question you know, is, yeah okay, you know i'm not sure you'd be able to i think if you were to step out on a limb and talk about that you'd be going off in a direction that we really don't have good evidence for i'm trying to think through all of the descriptions of crucifixion and yeah there's yeah, nothing no. for jesus though i don't i don't think we can i don't think we can say what is 
what is really fascinating is they didn't break his legs and cause him to suffocate. Um, so the guards knew that he was already dead and he's doing all that screaming about being thirsty and they're giving him that antidote. There's some funny circumstances on the cross, you know, um, it is but, a yeah, weird, what, it's a whether weird he got the nails through the hands or through the wrists. I'm not, I don't think anybody can say as far as I know. Yeah. There's not, there's no archeology span for it. That's for sure. Yeah. If and there if was, they, if there was, you would never stop hearing about it. Yeah. And when, yeah, they, when they crucified, when the Romans crucified people, they, they experimented, they, they did all kinds of experiments to try and make it as, as painful and, and, uh, draw it out as long as possible. Like sometimes they wouldn't even nail them. Sometimes they would just tie them. Sometimes they put like a, a little right. piece of a little block of wood under their butt so they could kind of sit on it a little bit. So it would take it longer for them to die. Like they that's even worse, probably. Yeah. Yeah. So Rob, uh, Rob Atheist Scriptures IG. Thank you for the super chat. What would you say had the most influence on the development of Satan's character? The exile and Zoroastrian influence, Hellenistic myths, Roman Jewish war, Rome as Satan. Who wants to take this one out first? Um, if you want to say, if you want to say something about Satan, I got to chime in. It depends uh, on which Satan, the Old Testament or the New. Those are two different things. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. I and you know, people debate, and I've heard you had people on your show, Neil. Very good debates about, you know, who is Satan and did he really exist or was it a later made up figure and and whatnot. You can talk about all the apocrypha, dude. But you just you got to give the guy, guy credit for one thing. You know, he's guarding his tree. He's supposed to he's supposed to prevent her from eating it, the fruit, right? And she's like, uh, yeah, no, we really shouldn't. We're not supposed to eat this. He said, What did he say? What happened? And yeah, but she was that's like, not oh. that's not Satan until it's until Christianity says it's okay, Satan. That's Ophis in Greek, and that's what I'm getting to. Ophis, is this yeah, is okay. all Greek that I'm talking about, baby. I'm talking about Septuagint and what the Septuagint says, and in the Septuagint, Zoe is her name. Um, who goes by the bucket cry Eve, she is introduced to the serpent, right? Who the devil possesses. Um, yeah, but he just tells him the truth. That's what I don't get. Uh, uh, he, all he does is tell her the truth. He's like, no, 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 you're not going to die when you eat it. Your eyes are going to be open. You're going to be as gods, which in the Greek, it uses plural, which is odd. It says as gods. Yeah. So who is the devil? So far in Genesis, he's just the guy telling the truth. He's just a yeah, but here's the thing about that. I got to push back on that a little bit because mm -hmm. there's no indication from the Old Testament that the serpent is Satan. And here's why: I can actually prove it. I can actually demonstrate that it's not in that in that passage. What happens to the serpent? He gets forced to crawl on his belly and he gets cast out of heaven. That's it for him. He's done. Now, what happens later on in the Book of Job? You had Satan hanging out in the court of God of El, and he's the district attorney. He's the he's the accuser. That's what the name actually means, accuser. He is not the same character as the serpent. When the Christians come along, however many centuries later, in the book of Revelation, they identify the serpent as Satan, which is false, I think. But that's how you get this idea of Satan is the serpent, because they call him the old serpent in Revelation. But it doesn't make any sense. If he's cast out of heaven, then why is he in the book of Job? sitting right there still and he's and it says he's walking i'm walking to and fro i thought he got cast on his on his belly so that's that's refuted that's another christian right. misinterpretation and every every book between of genesis and revelation there is no mention of satan as a serpent at all he's no like, serpent yeah, anywhere yeah so why why do you think they come back to that whole uh attachment of the symbol of the serpent with satan they call him the dragon that old dragon why, yeah. why do we come back to that? What, could it could it be because temple guardians, like simp, like Satan was doing when he's guarding the tree, could it be the temple guardians like the dragons that serve Medea? Right, there's a dragon. Right, but that's, who guards that's, that's what the, the Christians tree, are doing. The Christians are taking the tree. Hang on, who guards the tree on which the golden fleece hangs? Right, right? and that that golden fleece supposedly has written on the song of the queen. So what are these dragons doing? Dragons are temple guardians, man. They're they're relic right. guardians. But that's um, what why saying. couldn't Satan? Why couldn't Satan have been one of these one of these uh, lesser powers that was guarding the guarding the tree? I don't know. I think you take it away from when you say Lucifer. He's the morning star, right? How can you, Neil? How can you? This is argument hour, right? Neil, how can you take a 
the morning star out of Satan, baby. That's terrible. Well, that's Satan. another that's another Christian misinterpretation because Lucifer, it actually technically is just a Greek god. He's also in Ovid's Metamorphosis in Latin Latin uh, mythology. So he's in Ovid's Metamorphosis. He's a good. He's not an evil character at all. He's the light bringer. He's the he's good. He's a good force of light. He's like Apollo, but somehow because of the text in Isaiah, where he says Hillel Hillel ben Shahor. Uh, son of the dawn who fell and he's referring to the king of babylon once again christians are taking this text and they're applying it to satan satan lucifer the devil the serpent they're all one and that's an idea that's an idea that we get and it's in the question too the person is with super chat is it come from zoroaster and i i say yes i'm not saying that could prove that or that's not what every scholar agrees on i'm me personally i think there is some influence there because the idea of there this dualism of good and evil Ahura Mazda and Anger Manu. That ideas, those ideas, I think, influence the Second Temple period, which Christianity later comes out of. And that's why you get this Satan character who is, he's Lucifer. He's the devil. He's the serpent. He's all everything. He's everything. He's even the king of Hades, too. He rules the underworld. He's Pluto. He's whatever. Anything you want, any evil character, he's that. Oh, Azazel, remember that character from Enoch? He's him, too. He's the one that fell. That's, that's Christian interpretation. That's not what how it if, was, was meant to be. What if the pagans said he was the son of the dawn, too? What if that's not a Hebrew, th just a Hebrew thing? What if the pagans said Eosphoros, because that's his name, right? Lucifer is the Latin. Eosphoros. Him, There's nothing well, evil about this bro. He's the child of dawn. He's the dawn bringer. He guards the gates of Olympus. What's wrong right? with that? He, he keeps, no, that's what I'm saying is, why couldn't the devil be a Greek god what why do we have a problem saying the devil in the garden is the devil who's the greek god uh eosphoros who's the dragon who guards the who guards the tree why can't why does that have to be a christian thing is what i'm saying that's what, what is, christians do they try to they try to if you look at justin martyr he does nothing not even justin martyr kelsis talks about this this is in contra kelsis by the way we were just talking about this kelsis makes the point that these christians they don't want any part of paganism they think that their theology is completely out on the outside of ours. They have nothing. They want nothing to do with interpretation or synchronism. They're in their own world, and they think they're right, but they're not. That's what, that's what Kelsa says. So that's how. That's why you, you. There are some weird Christians, like the Nazis, for example, who are like the same, the same stuff. Exactly. They're, they they want to be in their own world, as far as I'm concerned. But there are some weird offset Christians, like the Nazis, who are like Jesus is basically. Attis and Osiris, he's the same thing. So you, you do get that, but those are considered to be heretics, not right away, but later on. But but in the, when, when the Nassim preacher was around doing his thing, according to M. David Lewa, he was one of the most popular Christian theologians in the empire. So that those ideas were or were, were okay at first. They just they didn't be it didn't stick for the, the Christians didn't like that stuff. Is that you know what I mean? Stop scamming man says. While some Christians think not having very particular beliefs is damnable, look at the disciples in Jesus' time according to the Gospels. Endlessly misunderstanding, going against his will, and being quick to lose heart. <laughs> That's a good point. Why is that? Don't you think that makes no sense, though? Like, think about this. You got a guy who's performing miracles right in front of your eyes. He's walking on water. He's healing the dead. He's doing everything you want him to do. And then all of a sudden, at, the, at that last hour, when they're like, hey, are you friends with him? No, I don't know him. Would you, would you really do that? Would you really deny? Would you really? Or like, or like Thomas, doubting Thomas. After everything you just saw, you're still going to be like, I got to touch it myself. To me, that's like, okay, this is mythology. Yeah. This is not something that really happened. <laughs> it doesn't, the logic is just not there. It fails logic 101. For me, it would depend on what he was arrested for, whether or not I would back him. I don't know. I might run like Peter and James and John if he were arrested for the wrong thing. You know what I mean? Right. Well, that's another thing. If there's any truth to these claims, if they are still doubting it, then that tells you that none of those miracles happened, that he, they, don't, they don't know what's going on. You know what I mean? I don't know. It just It's circular arguing, but it doesn't. Either way, it doesn't make sense. Yeah. 
But thank you for that super chat. Stop scamming, man. Let's go to the next one. Maynard says, I heard Jesus chipped his teeth, biting his nails. And you know, <laughs> is it, are you making fun of the leather super chatter from before with the <laughs> blasphemy? Blasphemy. You know, there might be some evidence for this, actually. I think if we go to Israel, which I'm going in October, if I find any uh, nails, I'm going to make sure that we test it out and it's going to date to the first century. So yeah, you guys will hear here first. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to change. I'm going to, I'm going to have breaking news and be famous forever. But um, yeah, I don't know. What do you guys think about that? Yeah, it's a cheap shot of blasphemy. You pagan, you pagan Satanist. Yeah, uh, no, no. There are some interesting details about him being on the cross. The stuff that we don't, that we don't quite understand. Um, like what was in that cup that they gave him for the remedy? Yeah, White is known as claim that it was uh, uh, viper venom antidote. <laughs> you know? It is a weird passage. Like, why would you put that in there? What does that have to do with the story? He's on a cross. He's about to die. Oh, but they gave him this weird thing of wine all of a sudden. Just good. Like, why is that in the story? You know, you gotta be nice to him. Like, unless they were trying to prolong his death, like here you get some water, you'll live a little bit longer and suffer more. I I don't know. That's what confused me about about his crucifixion is like when, when you're crucified, it would take days for you to die, like three, four, five days, yeah, uh, if not more. And he died in like three hours. Like how? That, that like nobody died time. in three hours. When you're crucified. It, it even says in the text that the centurion was surprised how fast yeah. it was, right? Yeah, because he went up there to like break his legs, and he's like, "Oh, he's already dead." Huh. Right. Yeah, what's the kind of What's the chance it could have been an overdose? Because you know, before he's dying, he's all like, oh, "I'm dying of thirst," right? He keeps screaming about his thirst, and Nona says the antidote to the viper venom is to the viper that makes you thirsty. It has. It makes you have dipsomania you're 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 you just can't get enough water to the point that you can burst your stomach it makes me wonder with all the drugs if jesus got something in the garden that was maybe some you know he said let this cup pass was he doing some hardcore you know some hardcore something with that naked kid he was with i don't know i don't know did you see that um chat that in the chat neil uh the, the, link, the link's been pushed out of the chat oh was it here let me send another one I, yeah, because I, I can't pin it. Derek has to pin it with his account. So, if Derek, uh, if you are watching, just try to pin that if you, if you see it. But I know you're busy, so hopefully he sees it or something. But, yeah, let's jump right in, guys. It's probably driving. You, you only need one hand to drive, Derek. All right, take pick up your phone with your other hand. Work your magic and put that link in. <laughs> yeah, so I just threw that out there. Keep one eye on the road, though. One eye on the road, one eye on your phone. You know, right. Be safe right. about it. But. Yeah, just, you know. You know, what you do you guys know. think as, as modern day apostates, um, which I applaud you for? <laughs> uh, it's good. It's good. To, it's good to know you're going to hell. Um, but <laughs> as modern day apostates, what what would you say about the resurgence of uh, psychotropics and psychedelic drugs and the fusion with religion? Do you think there could be anything going on in antiquity? Was John the Baptist doing anything when he took those? those you know people out to have yeah, heaven yeah. opened up what what do you think drugs that's the topic just tr drugs and and hold religion. that thought hold that thought we got a super chat hold that thought it's a good topic though anyways jim markstein any idea what pagan or greek ideas influence christianity here we go this is a good one that's anyone good. want to go first i don't want to i don't want to hog the hole Oof. um oh, paul is a, is heavily hellenized uh, yeah. when he's writing his his letters and there's little bits of greek mythology peppered in there but you got to kind of look for them but at the same time you got to make sure you're not like jumping to conclusions or committing um parallelomania right um but there are, there are definitely things there like like paul quotes a, a, a play called agamemnon which is about um it was about zeus's one of zeus's sons i can't remember the details but yeah, like, he also he, has the Cre Cretans are lazy thing in there too. Yeah, so he he's he's quotes a Greek play like he knows this stuff. He quotes Plato's Republic yeah. more, more than one time, like three or four times. Oh, it's definitely Platonic Christianity. Yeah, definitely influenced, especially through Philo, who's a plate, who's a Middle Platonist. 
Mm-hmm. Philo has an idea of God being of nature of three. Philo has the idea of a logos inheriting the kingdom of heaven from the father, who's the father of intellect, who's who uh, who's going to judge us all at the end. This is all that's Platonism. Yeah. So I think Christianity is like a sort of like a Judaized version or no, a Platonized version of Judaism. Yeah. And, and, I, even and, I, like, and I like what McDonald brings up. Like McDonald brings up the mimesis thing where you have. For example, Jesus being anointed by his feet by a woman whose name is uh, who, who's, who he tells her family far and wide. And in the, in the Odyssey, Odysseus, his feet anointed by a woman, her name's Eurycleia. Eurycleia means fame far and wide. That's a clear cut Mises to me. It's also in the Krishna epic, too. What's, uh, what's, what's that example? The anointing of the feet by the woman. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, wow. that's interesting. When Krishna arrives in the main city. Oh, wow. Yeah, let's see. There's so much. Is it the Mahabharata you're talking about? Yeah, the Mahabharata. Yeah. So there's, another, there's actually another text in the Mahabharata about this um, this this uh, this narrative where these Brahmins are showing up to a town to and like the they had the caste system in, in India. The Brahmins are on top. So when a Brahmin comes to your town, you got to cook them food. It doesn't matter who you are. You stop what they're doing. You cook them food. Give them hospitality. So the Brahmins show up, they have no food, and Krishna is like, oh, ye of little faith. He doesn't say it like that, but like, he's like, what, where is your faith? He's like, what do you guys have? Like, we, have one, we have one rice bean or whatever, you want, it, one piece of rice. He goes, let me get that piece of rice. He throws it into a pot, and all of a sudden they have a whole full thing of everybody's full, everybody eats, everybody's happy. Now that to me sounds a lot like the Christian. I'm not saying one bower from the other, but I'm saying that seems like an idea that somebody's probably thinking of, or it's in the air, or something mm-hmm. like that. You know what I mean? It sounds very similar. But and even Tertullian just, was a um, um, he was a Stoic, so he's he's the one that 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 fought very hard for the flesh and blood resurrection because Stoics don't believe in like a, a spiritual being. So when he re- he writes a book um, on the flesh on, on the resurrection of the flesh, like he ha- he talks about this a lot. He's like, there is no spirit when Jesus resurrect using the flesh and he's arguing with christians who believe that he resurrected in the spirit because at the time the spiritual resurrection like paul talks about uh by his view that's the normal view that's not weird to, to, but to be resurrected in the flesh that is weird so he had to fight for that and tertullian's one of, like the main ones um he even like uh attacked the uh Midianites, uh not many nights um i forget the second christianity that was like basically charismatic pentecostals in the second century Man, because of them anyway but they were running around speaking in tongues claiming oh, that God was... no not marcy knights oh, okay, uh, okay uh, but yeah go ahead uh, yeah they, they run around saying prophesying like god was speaking through them and uh yeah speaking in tongues and they were being very exuberant and like their worship in public places which is another thing they were like don't do that we're trying to to keep keep it chill down here um but yeah, yeah. He, he fought for the resurrection of flesh because he was a Stoic. That that lined up with his Stoic philosophy. And eventually, that's where they settled. Wow, that's interesting. Uh, there's one more super chat uh, from I look 5 Do I do I have to go to Satanic Mass every to be a good Satanist? <laughs> I say it's what is in your heart that matters. That's funny. What do you guys think about that? Yeah, amen, amen. Hail Satan, brother. <laughs> I need to be the first one to say something. Oh, it's another one. Wow, these are just popping up left and right. So, uh, Inquisitive Mind, thank you for this super chat. We're both Jesus and Muhammad Jewish movements. Ooh, what do you guys think about that? The answer is yes on that one, right? Abrahamic, I'd say. I don't know about Jewish, but Abrahamic. Yeah, Abraham definitely. Uh, Muhammad actually sought the approval of the Jews to make him the new prophet. Like he wanted to be the, uh, the next Messiah, and they rejected him for it. So immediately afterwards, he starts writing text or having his text recorded of him attacking the Jews because they didn't accept him as the new prophet. So he wanted it to be a Jewish movement, even though he wasn't. But the Jews, yeah, didn't didn't want anything to do with that. Yeah. Khalil probably can add to this, but there's there is a lot of um, in a lot of passages in the Quran that's you know the children of Israel and remember remember Moses, remember Abraham, remember this, remember, you know, what do you think about that, Khalil? Uh, I, I would 
I've never heard that before. I'd like to actually see the references uh, on on where he sought Jewish approval. Not saying that you're wrong. I'm just I'd just be open to hearing where you're getting that information from. I think Derek had a scholar on recently talking about the Jewish origins of Islam. It, it's probably one of those the recent videos if you check them out. Hmm. I think I know which one you're talking about. I heard I've from what I've gathered or uh, you know from my amateur point of view is that Muhammad was in an area where there was pagans, there was Christians, there was Muslims, there was Zoroastrians, and he was sort of like engaged in dialogue with all these different groups, basically saying, here's the true religion, come here, and they're all rejecting. He's like, no, okay, that's on, that's on you, dude. You, you could have had the real one, but you rejected it. That's on you now. And so that's what I've heard. So I don't know. I'm not sure how much he was trying to get them to, but you know, I'm not. Like I said, I'm not an expert, so I, don't, I have no idea. Anyone else? Yeah, I don't have a lot of information on that. I, I, I know that he was living in an area where there was mostly pagans. Uh, yeah, there was. I think there was uh, Waraka was a Christian. Uh, he's actually the one that, after the uh, Prophet peace be upon him. Uh, got the revelation, went to his wife. His wife took him to uh, took him to Wataka, and Wataka was like, yes, you, you've received a revelation from God. Uh, you are a prophet. And uh, I think three days later, Wataka died. Uh, but there oh, were... Was the Koresh tribe Jewish tribe, actually? Uh, the Koresh? No, I believe that they were pagans. Oh, okay. Okay, I could have swore they were, but I might be wrong. But yeah. Caleb Jackson's here. What's up, Caleb? What's up, Neil? What, what's going on? What you what you been up to? Uh, nothing that unusual. You know, Derek's been calling me a lot because he's driving and bored, I guess, you know, since he's moving. I know you're taking over right now. So, uh, yeah, that's good. But I'm just hanging Oh, there's out. a whole bunch of people down here. Okay, I didn't even see those. There's a whole other line. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, Caleb, good to see you again, man. <laughs> good to see you, man. Um, I'm trying to think. That's a we're caught up on super chat so i don't know anybody want to just say something yeah yeah i yeah. came in here to say that i think a lot of history could be just completely made up like well i think already we can most or maybe not most of us i see there are some religious people in here but as far as the old testament stuff goes i don't think dad pool or amen or gnostic and foreman think we came from a bud man and a rib um so that's already kind of out of the question and then uh, just throughout all of history, we have documented lying, even lies about lying, which is just wild. And I just don't think that if there was a God that and it knew everything, that it would put so much weight on some written papers to try and communicate with us as to whether or not it existed, knowing just how deceptive and shaky history as a discipline and a thing is. How would you suggest he do it? Oh, he could just pop up right now if uh, if if, if this he was God, that all powerful one. If, if this God is unlimited, how could he fit inside of a limited creation? It's almost like asking me asking you to put an infinite amount of water into this water bottle. It's logically impossible. So yeah, then that would be a impossible being. No, it so would be Steven. impossible for the being to enter creation. That's the only, so that's, that's then, the only logical entailment. You're saying the being has never entered creation? Nope. So then the Quran definitely isn't inspired because the being's never been here. Never so said we it was can inspired. rule that out. Well, that's not the claim of Islam. Islam doesn't say it's inspired. That's a Christian claim. Whatever it is, it's got no relation to the God since it can't be here by your So parameters. God can't send finite angels down to reveal the message? Okay, well, then an angel popping up in front of everyone, sure, if that's how we're going to play. Yeah. It's a created being, yeah. So yeah. Khalil? Let's, let's Khalil? Get the angels popping up. Khalil? What's up, Are man? you put? Oh, I was going to say, thank you for the other night. That was a lot of fun, sure. and I learned so much sit sitting with you guys. That was, a, you know, great to be respectful. Again, a little, it's a little friction here and there, but you got to expect <laughs> that. Yeah, I wasn't expecting that between you and, uh, what was it, random atheist? I was good. Neither was I. And, and we ended up seeing that we were actually very close together. We were just, you know, basically, you know, tomato, tomatoing each other to death. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, but I wanted so to Steve, say when you were you. when you were saying about God, that, that God can't incarnate, 
aren't you putting a limitation on God then? No, because logical impossibilities do not exist. Like if I was to say, is there a square circle in reality? You would say, no, a square circle doesn't exist. But that doesn't mean that someone's limited from being able to do that. You can't be limited by non, uh, non-existence. Non-existence yet, you can't apply positive attributes to something that doesn't exist. So you can't say that this non-existence is limiting somebody because then that non-existence would then be a thing. So God can do all logically possible things. He can know all true propositions, but anything outside of logical possibility, you just could easily say can't do. No, no, I, I can respect that. It's just you're operating from a more limited perspective of God than I am because I see God as capable of logically impossible things. And in yeah, I couldn't do that. That's strange. No, no, j- j- just just a difference of you know, just a different sure. starting point, you know. Yeah. Graham, how do you identify? Yeah, Christian uh, or Islam, yeah. Muslim, Fr- freelance yeah. monotheist. Free- hmm. All right, can I, that, I got that from Karen Armstrong. Karen Armstrong. Okay, I was going to say if I can ask. So, Khalil, when you said God can't enter creation, what's what is? Uh, I think I've asked you this before, way back. But what's your uh, model in terms of God's relation to time? Do you think He enters creation upon that, or does He exist outside of time? And that's no, no, no. I don't believe that time is a creation. Oh, so you he exists think- within time, but in time is an attribute of God. For God to be able to create things in a successive manner, uh, that's multiple different states of affairs. So if you were to say that God exists outside of time mm-hmm. and then created thing in a successive manner, he would need it to have time to create time. And I just find that as a logical impossibility. So do you think that God was doing like an infinite number of things prior to creating? No, 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 no. I believe that he existed outside of time until mm-hmm. he chose to express his attribute of time. Once he expressed it, he stepped into time and then created things in a successive manner. Well, so he was existing time unchangeably. Uh, time is a measurement of change. Yeah. So before he created things, he was just... There was in, nothing going in on. One, in one just, state of affair, yeah. You need at least two states of affairs to have time. If so he had never one, done one, anything before. Mm-mm. Well, he was he was literally just doing the same thing, but it didn't change. Mm-hmm. So well, you can be what doing do you mean something he was doing the same. So, thing? like for example, have you ever heard the bowling ball pillow analogy? Yeah, uh, uh, maybe. Yeah. But like he's like pushing a rock up a hill, like over and well, no, over. No, no, not not pushing because I mean like that would be taking a coin over and no, over. No, again. no, just, just sitting there. It's just not sitting there, basically doing nothing. Not doing nothing, but he could be he could be thinking, right? but not having multiple different thoughts, just one entire thought as one state of affairs unchanging until he expressed time. And that was the first moment to where he had stepped into that attribute of time. Did he change when he expressed time for the first one? Did he change at the moment when he expressed time? In relation, not by nature. Okay. that that, So it's an external, not an internal. Correct. Because like as soon as he does something, though, that means that he is bound by time. Correct. Yeah, he has a reference point in time at that point. I think it's the only logical way to be able to explain it. So it's not a non-changing God. It can it changes over time. In relation, like like Caleb said, it's external, not internal. So his like nature God, doesn't change. God didn't always have the property of having created you until you were born, but that doesn't mean that that that's an external change, not an internal change. I think is what he's saying. Correct. Yeah. So yes, God changes in terms of he creates other things, and he didn't have the property of being creator before that. But internally, his desires and stuff don't change mm-hmm. in that sense. Yeah, this so, is basically what William Lane Craig says, that God existed beyond the physical universe without hmm. time, and when he created, he entered time. But I see absolutely no logical contradiction that he could incarnate in, in Jesus. Now, let me ask to Stephen. You said that you think that Genesis is not uh, sound, but um, science Oh, Tangelo, I'm just going to stop you right there. I've seen you shut down by I don't know how many people. This science is not my field. I really don't care to have this discussion with oh, you. He may so. bring up the shot of turn with you. Who knows? <laughs> Even that, I, I yeah. just... There, I've seen Otangelo shut down so many times by so many people, and he just repeats the same thing over and over again to new people. Hold that thought. With, I don't know. Maybe they hold, haven't heard it before. Hold that thought. I got a super chat. I, got, I always got a super chat. So I always get to skip everybody because they are paying for it. The Quran <laughs> argues. Stop scanning, man. They can super chat. The Quran argues there must be one God. For if there were several, there would be discord and destruction in creation. Very naive argument. Impiously claiming God would behave like a toddler with Lego. In this setting, yeah, I'd like to see the reference for that verse. God can only be one because there can only be one necessary being. If you have two things claiming to be a necessary being, 
then you'd be able to, according to the law of identity, draw distinctions between them. So one would have a trait that the other didn't have. And if one necessary being is lacking or limited in a trait, he's not a necessary being. So there could only actually be one necessary being on a logical basis. That's the argument that's being made for one God. Hey, everybody's assuming God is a man. Is there anybody out there who thinks God may be a woman? Or neither. No, he's he is not a man. He's not a spirit. He's he's a it's a mind. That's it. I think it's Ariana yeah. Grande says God's a woman. I think that since it's 2022, we should respect God's preferred gender pronouns. And I think he, I think he's gender binary or uh, what, what is it? Gender neutral? Uh, gender fluid? No. Yeah. Whatever. Yeah. Hey, um, what, what, Halil, what is Halil? the Islamic response to the not not having the angels pop up to show everyone? Say that again. So, so like when you asked, how would I expect the God to come into creation? You know, he can mm -hmm. send his angels in. What's what is the uh, explanation there for why your God doesn't do that? Yeah, because his life is a test and he he's not here. If he if he if he was to bring angels down to convince everybody without a doubt that God's real, that would kind of defeat the purpose. So we believe that we existed in the realm of souls prior to us being humans. And we chose to take this test knowing that we were going to come down and have trials and tribulations. So basically what you're asking is for the answers to the test while you're taking the test. And I don't think any college would actually give you those. They would give you a guide, like guideline books to study, uh, which would in this case would be the Quran. And then we could study the Quran and, uh, and we could come to logical conclusions and we could ponder on things and look at other worldviews and see how they're logically incoherent and how Islam actually holds to uh, a logical standard. So if your God does know everything, then he knows who's going to pass the test already. Yeah, he knows. Yeah. But, and but, so but knowledge is knowledge is to see it all play out not like dominoes. Yeah, sure. Like he, he doesn't, he doesn't, he's not, we in Islam don't believe that God's all loving that he wants all to be saved because, and I mean, this is no disrespect to Caleb, but uh, I mean, the, the God of the Bible desires for all to be saved, but uh, the, well, they're I suppressing him. Islam is the true religion. Oh, did he? Did he, <laughs> he was going to give the I don't answers. Know, I don't know. No idea. I, I agree with this for the first half of what he said, and then he didn't get to say the second half. So I, I think he's Satan. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Anyways, who is next? Who is up? Who is who is saying something before that? I think history. No, well, it was, Tangelo was a history skeptic. Didn't want to go down that route, and then I think. No, you know, just just did I hear that right? He said that we existed prior to to. To Khalil said that. As a spirit or something? Yeah, Khalil said that. Yeah, I yeah, think Khalil's, Khalil's going with the whole well of souls concept, where the you know that's that's from Jewish Jewish mythology as well, as well, where that that they exist pre pre existent in a well, and the souls come and incarnate. Yeah, that's interesting. I don't know, history skeptic. How do you know that? Uh, I, I would I would say, how do we know that God hasn't sent an angel or some other being to to appear to people? You know, I think that's. A little bit of begging the question, but it depends on what what standards you need to to establish well, that. I wouldn't say uh, we know. You know, maybe he has. And I mean, I'll, I, I, would, I think I'll, that if he sent one to everyone at the same time, well, like if we were all right here, all chatting, and then we all say like, "Oh, hey, this thing just popped up in my room," and like I could say something to it, and it can communicate to the one by you, and then say it to you. Well, there, there then, was a case in the in the nineteen sixties where allegedly the some being that people thought was the Virgin Mary appeared on top of a church where tens of thousands of people saw it over a course of three years and there's photographs of it. So that's probably the closest analogy I could think of. I'm not saying you'd buy that, but just like, that's like, well, you know, maybe I don't want to so depend on what, what the case was. Although I don't think she, Mary quote unquote talked to anybody. Are you religious? I'm a Christian. I'm not a Catholic or do you Muslim. believe in that? The Mary thing appearing? I think something happened. Uh, I don't necessarily know the explanation, but I, I've not been convinced by the naturalistic explanation people have given. So I'd be I curious of, to learn more. Sounds yeah. No, totally. Trippy. Tens of yeah, thousands yeah, of people you say over three years. Well, yeah, it was in you know, local newspapers and they, what they did, it was just first, what had happened was, and this was in Egypt. So mostly Muslim, but it, on this Coptic church, um, uh, a, a taxi, I think it was a taxi driver or a worker, saw a woman on top of a church. He's like, oh my, he thought she was going to commit suicide, like jump off the, the building. So they called the police and get people there. And as they're looking, they're like, actually, you know, that kind of looks more like a, like almost like a luminous figure. And they're like, oh wait, that's the Virgin Mary's church. Maybe that's her. And so this, uh, this figure, this bright figure would appear and disappear 
over the course of several, uh, over the course of three years, sometimes it'd be several times a week, sometimes it'd be a couple times a month. And there'd be these like dove figures next to her and people uh, allegedly reported being healed. And they had this commission set up. Actually, the guy who first saw her had a gangrened hand that he was going to get amputated the next day. But when he pointed to her, the next day when he went in, his finger was completely healed. So I think it's interesting. You can look it up. There's a there's yeah, a, it's Our Lady of Light. I found it. Our Lady of Zaitun, but that's equivalent. Or, I, I see, yeah, a bunch yeah, of yeah. different names for it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but they shut down all the lights in the in the uh, in the town for a day, and like it was still there, and they couldn't find anything within a 15 mile radius. So, the closest explanation I could find is maybe earthquake lights, but then it's like, why were they only appearing on top of a church, and why are they only appearing in these? So I, yeah, I still don't think any, there's any good natural explanation. I'm not saying that th that means it's automatically supernatural, but all I'm saying is that I think it's fascinating and I'm surprised it's not more well-known and more discussed. Like I would rather people say, well, here's the, an alleged example and here's why it's wrong rather than just not even addressing it or, or doing it. So that's just how I see it. But I, I think the world's a fascinating place. And what I think is cool is that um, to bring it back to history, like Josephus talks about when the temple is about to fall down, how there was this big light at the temple that, you know, people reportedly saw the supernatural light that appeared on the altar. And that really reminds me a lot of that. It's like, well, we have a light in Egypt appearing on top of a church. That's unexplained. It's like, it's interesting that Josephus mentions this weird light, which I guess people thought was Yahweh or something uh, appearing in the temple. So the point is weird stuff happens today. I'm certain, I'm certain weird stuff happened back then, especially when science was less developed. So um, I think finding the parallel history in, in the modern world are really fascinating. Has anyone yeah, else heard yeah. of this? We oh, yeah, go for it. Rob. Yeah, sorry, sorry not to cut you off, but just so I keep keep these on, you know, I don't get far behind on these. Uh, Rob Atheist, create is only coherent in temporal terms. Even if you claim simultaneous creation, you're using temporal terms. Timeless, spaceless, mind-affecting matter, Occam's razor, compounding unknowns. Hmm. Wow. What do you guys think? Depends on how you're defining create. I agree that create typically means to bring into existence, so that would be temporal. But you could still have a contingent thing that's eternal. So it depends on what you mean by create and what you mean by like contingent. That's true. Yeah. Uh, well, if anyone else has anything to say about that, I got another one after that. Stop scamming, man. Uh, thank you for the super chat. Quran twenty one twenty two. Had there been any gods in the heavens and in the earth apart from Allah, the order of both the heavens and the earth would have been gone to ruins. The apologist necessary being claim is more clever than the Qurans. <laughs> Our Muslim's gone, so I, I guess he's not here to uh, defend that. <laughs> yeah, I guess. Yeah. But, um, yeah, it's a good point, though. You know, It's a pretty good argument for polytheism. Well, friendly Muslim's here. Oh, sorry, I couldn't see the name with all the... He's probably, uh, he probably went for a walk or something, because uh, he's not saying anything. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, oh, I, still, I see him now. Okay, I, the the thing was covering the name. And it wasn't paying attention. What were you saying, Zeleny? Though, no, it's a pretty good argument for polytheism. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, I see what you're saying. Yeah, I guess you're right. Well, it did, did, so would polytheism would all the gods have equal equal power? Because I feel like then you'd get contradictions if two gods had different wills and wanted to do mutually no, things. Or they that's the explanation of a lot of the polytheistic religions in the ancient world. That's That was their explanation as to why the world was so messed up, why we had yeah. natural disasters that are destroying the planet. Sorry, the kids. Um, but that was their explanation. There's multiple gods that are at war with each other or just disputing mm -hmm. with each other or you know, doing whatever. Um, that was their explanation. So now if it's, if it's just one god, well then, yeah, that one god's not very good at his job. Right, yeah, it's more chaotic in that sense. Caleb, do you think there's something in in the female divinity that the Greeks worship? Could you worship a female god, uh, being a Christian, <laughs> or a mother god? You worship a father god, I know that, but can you sympathize with the, the figure of the, the mother god? I don't have any issue with portraying God as a woman if that's how I thought that. I don't think that God is literally, I mean, I think Jesus was a man, obviously, but I don't think that God the Father is literally a man. I think it's just the personification being used. But, you know, if the Greeks pictured God as a woman, I don't think there's anything inherently wrong with that. So um, you wouldn't mind if I said her only begotten son was sent into the world that we might all be saved. That wouldn't bother you. Well, as I said before, I think given the, the story, I think if someone has preferred pronouns, they prefer to be called. And if Yahweh wants to be called he, I would call him a he. So uh, I kind of want to find out if Yahweh has what parts he's got. Because we all approach him like he's a he, 
What so about should we treat him as a he or what about the Greek uh Theo? What is it? Theo Tacos? Three Theo Tacos? Yeah, the one who bears the god. Yeah, the, the god, god bearer. God, right? Yeah. So does Mary kind of fit that? Is Mary kind of the Christian uh Dea? Well, There's I think Catholics thing. call her the mother of the, the queen of heaven. And I'm not Catholic, so I don't I'm not defending that, but they would I think they say she's the highest form in all creation that they, that she's elevated. She's not as high as God or Jesus, but she's a step down from that. So that's I think how they would perceive that. Because the so, Catholic, the Catholics are praying to Mary. They can that's she's part of the for intercession of Mary. That they don't think that like you're asking Mary to ask God, or sure. like you're asking the saints to ask God. That's yeah. how they've explained it. I th I I don't know why you don't just cut to God either. I mean, that's you know. But that's that's how they would say. It. Although people do ask other people to pray for them, so they they say it's just like that but with dead people. And it's like that seems like mediumship to me. But okay. <laughs> There's actually a, a Catholic teaching that Mary is um, a quasi incarnation of the Holy Spirit. That's how they call it. Yeah, the Sophia aspect, right? The wisdom of God. That's why they call her the Corredemptrix. Like he, she is redeeming people alongside Jesus. Like whatever i like that that's like a female god right there that's pagan i smell pagan on that <laughs> there was an ancient christian group called coleridians with the k when you google it and uh, y k y l l coleridians they worship mary as a goddess oh wow interesting yeah robert herring what's going on robert i haven't seen you in a while were you on vacation or something good to see you robert hey guys love love to you Decided to go back to the classroom as both a middle school sped teacher and go back myself for an endorsement. Hell and T Satan. <laughs> OT dude is my bud. I will drop in as I can. Nice. Robert Herring. Good guy. Oh, Robert Herring gave me this. He sent this to me. Hell Satan, Rob. Yeah. <laughs> Rob's the man. Rob's the man. What do you guys think? I was going to say something about the uh, the Marian apparitions and throw out an idea for you guys. And that is one of the things that I noticed is those dropped off right about the time that UFO appearances started. And sort of them both being incarnations of sort of the unknown, and the human mind trying to grapple with it. And sort of as religion was on the way out, science on the way in, and UFO substituted. Little green men instead of little Mary. What do you guys think? That's crazy. <laughs> I think there were UFO sightings before the sighting of Mary, weren't there? First sighting of Mary sighting was of Mary. Uh, like 1500s in uh, Mexico. Uh, uh, Lady of Guadalupe. Guadalupe one, yeah. Yeah, that, that's probably a late. I think I don't think the documentation of that's good at all. But Isn't there another one like in like uh, Armenia well, or something? Well, there was Fatima that, that you have all the pictures of during World War One. Yeah, yeah, that, that was, was in 17. Yeah. Yeah. Well, even, well, no, Magigoria was after was in the 90, 80s, I think, or 90s. Was, yeah, but I'm just saying that I, I see a lot of parallels between how the UFO appearances with the unknown and the questioning yeah. and the Marian appearances. It's like neither of them exactly tell the truth as to who they are, even when questioned. I think that's a fair. I mean, I think there are weird things in the sky that people. I, yeah, I certainly don't deny that. The only, and there are. I think when you look at some of the pictures of the stuff I was talking about, like it does. Sometimes it, I can see the parallels. Like I could see this being seen as a UFO when you look at like the dove, quote unquote, uh, things. Um, but I think it's the fact that it's like happened to be constantly involved with the church and like the location. Like if these were appearing in different places around the area, I think that'd be more analogous. But that's kind of what makes it different in that sense. But yeah, I do think that's an interesting observation but it depends on the one right i mean like with lords in, in 1850 you had bernadette the 14 year old girl allegedly talking and having conversations with virgin mary so i don't think that's really now this ufo so it really just depends on the case but i think that is a interesting thought um, yeah what about what about joan of arc and all her visions man yeah yeah gotta, yeah, yeah. what is that story i don't even remember that story i remember hearing it before but she, she got burned at the stake didn't she did she really yeah, After yeah, all, yeah, yeah i think did. so yeah she did all she that did. work and then they killed her still? Yeah. That's if great. you ever want to if you ever want to see, if any of your viewers ever want to see a woman burned at the stake, go get the uh, uh his, French historian Jules Michelet, and he will write to you about um what the women did. It's it's interesting to watch what they did as they were burned and their reactions. What do you mean and watch? Were, you mean read? 
Yeah, right. Oh, I see. What and saying. there was there was one uh, there was one that I was mentioning to Eel, Neil earlier, and uh, she actually took everything in her control. And during her during uh, when she was being burned, she was actually telling the people around her exactly that this was their judgment. That look upon what kind of people they are. That their God was the God of Hell. That's what isn't that awesome? I thought it takes a lot of courage to do that's that. A way, that's a good way to go out. Yeah, where's all that woman pagan? Because you know that's you know? part of the punishment is they want you to scream and suffer. But if you go out like that, like right back at your face, that's you won that one. That's you know what I mean. That's a that's a win in my mind. But. What do you think, Caleb? How do you, how do you, um, because I've always, even when I was a Christian, I used to think of the history of the church. Mm. And I used to, I couldn't, I, it bothered me that the church that I was associated with was like killing people for so long and doing, and like causing wars and inquisitions and trials and forcing Jews to live in ghettos and anti Semitism and just a lot of terrible history. What do you, what do you, how do you grapple with that? Yeah, I mean, I think any religion that's been around for 2000 years can get messed up eventually. I mean, I think Christianity started off as for the first couple of centuries, pretty, pretty pacifist and as a minority. Um, and then, of course, by, you know, what the 10th, the 11th century, when you had the Crusades and stuff, and you had all the Inquisition. So, yeah, I think that that's. Wait, well, I don't know. I think as early as the fifth century, the fourth century, they were already burning down temples. The well, it's still four. That's still four centuries out. But yeah, but I mean, if you compare that with, I don't know. I don't. I don't want to. That's well, when they got power. That's when they first got power. Fourth yeah, century. I don't. I don't mind that. But I'm saying if you, can, I don't want to throw Islam under the bus. But Islam was pretty much doing the war conquest sure. thing from the get go. But and, they, and they, uh, I think they not that, that justifies the the Christian tra- uh, stuff. Right. that was terrible. But uh, yes, if if you're asking, I'm very much against burning heretics at the stake. Uh, and inquisitions so i'm um, also not raised catholic so i'm not saying protestants didn't do that because they did but it was they they were had their own issues uh with that so all of them i think humans are just generally pretty awful historically and i think that's pretty much united for any particular group of people religious or not neil do you think we can pin the blame on the whole violence thing somewhat on augustine with his policy with his uh, principle of just war where because of this, we can now go around killing people. Before that, Christians couldn't justify it. Mm-hmm. I think that's part of it. But I also think that because because Constantine wasn't that bad. He he legalized Christianity, but he didn't make it like the sole religion of the empire. But like Theodosius, though, which is like, you know, still in the same century, but way later in the century, like late 300s. He was like hardcore anti everything else like he wanted to make sure christianity was the only religion at that point it didn't take long for that to happen but yeah i think the augustine thing was a big deal too but yeah i don't know why how does why does that happen why can't what is that such a is that have to be such a progressive uh idea to have freedom of religion like why does it why does it take so long when the greeks already had something like that going on even the romans kind of did uh but what, what happens with Christianity all of a sudden in Islam where it's like, no, you have to have this faith. Uh, you know what I mean? I don't know. What do you guys think about that? It's not until like way later, 1700s, where finally people are like, yeah, do your own thing. Have your own religion. You know? Yeah. Why are the Romans blaming the Christians for burning down Rome for uh, in order to bring the apocalypse? Why is there this constant plan of of heaping up the people into groups and destroying one and yeah, the that's other one is elect. Yeah. Is it something inherent in mystery religions? That's what I would say. It's inherent to mystery religions, bro. That's why they always end up caging people. Probably. They're on, they're on the bad side of the other end, which is when you have like an empire like Rome, they're always finding a scapegoat to blame every problem on. And when you have a mystery religion, that makes it easy to just, that secret thing is the whole problem. Let's get them all. Yeah, it's those Bakkans. It's those Bakkans. Kill them all, all, baby. And that's the thing. The mystery religion, they just want to be left alone. They want. They just want to have their initiates. They want to be in their corner. They don't want to be the big thing. You know what I mean? I think Christianity started off that way. I think it was the glory to the glory years of Christianity, the early years, first century, early second. Those are the those are the Christians I really like. I'm not gonna lie. When I read about those guys, I I like them. I can't I can't I can't lie. I like the early Christians. I just do. 
it's when the, the whole church thing when they got when they got into power everything the whole patriarchal structure with the bishops and the pope and women can't do this and all that to me is like what happened where what happened to uh, pay, uh feeding the poor and you know uh, loving your neighbor all that all that good stuff that jesus get told us what happened to all that stuff you know what, what I mean? happened to you can drink snake venom and it won't hurt you <laughs> Uh, that part's not even in original Mark either. That's a later edition. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> a later scribal edition. Yeah. The, it should be also noted that like Rome at one point expelled the Stoics. Like they the persecuted Jews Stoics. Right. Like who they, who the, they powered from, by the way. But like the Stoics were Roman pagans. They just had a different like philosophy and ethics. Yeah, they were, and, the, like, they were the first humanists. Uh, right, the uh, the, Le Le the um, Leocrit Leocritus or what is it? Um, Lucretius, Lucretius. Um, no, Lucretius is the Epicurean. Epicurean. Okay, you're right. You're right. I always get those. But, I always, yeah, I, I always get that mistake where I can. They're similar. Them. Yeah, but they're very they're similar. Like, yeah. But they're human. Emperor, Dom Emperor Domitian like expelled all the Stoics from Rome. A bunch of those famous philosophers ended up like outside the Roman Empire or some colonies or something. And they got charged with atheism. Some of them, you know. I don't know. I mean, have you have you read the have you ever read uh, um, what's his name Cicero's book on the nature of the gods, where he talks about the um, Stoics and the Epicureans, and he's basically having a dialogue with the pagans, and they talk about atheism a little bit. It's pretty good. It's a pretty good book. It's like a Platonic dialogue. It's an awesome book. Yeah. yeah, that was one of the first names for the Christians, too, is they called them atheists. They were first called sibilants yeah. or followers right, of the yeah. way. And then they call them atheists because they had no theoi. You know what I mean? Right. They didn't believe in all the all the um, the pagan uh, rituals. They didn't believe in the magic. They just were like, you can't trust you somebody. Neil, Neil, you can't trust somebody who doesn't follow DK, man. She's justice. If you have a goddess justice. And, and you've got some zealot who's saying, I can't trust this goddess or she doesn't exist. What are you going to do with this person? Next thing you know, they're, they're doing or orgiastic stuff. And you guys all know the accusations and whatnot, what they're doing with little boys. They take off the streets of Rome and Alexand uh, in Alexandria. The Romans don't like it. They don't put up with it. Right. So, yeah, this. Yeah. What do you do, man? What do you do? I don't know. Did you did you guys hear about the comparison that like early Christianity was uh, parallel to QAnon today? Because they were like, "Yo, dude, all these gods that you all believe in—that's all just a conspiracy theory." Listen to me, I got this super cool new story about yeah. how those are all demons, and they are like want to fucking you know burn you in hell. <laughs> like, you, know, you know what's funny about that is uh, <laughs> like the way Paul talks about the the archons and the rulers of this age, it almost sounds like the way QAnon talks about lizard people being in the government. So I guess you could make that comparison. It's all about vampires and baby blood. I'm telling you, I'm telling you, you're right. Thank you. Thank you for bringing that up. I'm actually going to have some baby blood after this is over. So you got to yeah. have some QAnon guys on, you know what I mean? To let them defend <laughs> so the religion. Got some right in here. It's Neil. What, what, age, what age does baby blood taste the best? Is it what, what uh, it looks like? How, baby how kids. Is it Younger, the better. Younger the fetal. Better. It turns out fetal is uh, the you best. Gotta, you got to go right for this week too. You know? Oh, yeah. They're okay. drinking it. They're drinking the fetal, the fetal. They give her an abortion and they drink it. It's oof. It's I don't know what it does. Right, we're gonna get Derek in trouble. Well, <laughs> oh, that's that's the that's history. Bro. That's history. No, I know, yeah, I know. You can't, you can't censor that. That's history. The pagans what's that Christian drank abortion. They drank abortions. That's history. What's that, and that's what what's, that, what's that ancient Christian apologist called um, against heresies? He has the Irenaeus. book called. The, yeah. Is, is that their names? Against heresies. One of them like has has a story about some Gnostics and how they are so super bad that instead of using bread and wine, they use fetuses and semen. semen. Yeah. Like Nicolai what the fuck? I, like, I yeah. told you. I told you it's that good. good stem that's Hippolytus. That's Hippolytus. <laughs> yeah, that was a slander campaign though. That wasn't like a historical just, record. That that's, was what just what tell, that's what I was trying to tell. That's what I was trying to tell Amon. I was like Amon. This might not. This might just be them slandering them, trying to make yeah. them sound crazy. I'm not because the Satanists in the Middle Ages do the same thing. And Neil, you gotta say there's some kind of chemistry going on. If we have the Hippocratic diseases of women talking about how to regulate menstruation, 
how to how to fasten it up, how to slow it down, how to produce abortions. Remember, the medicine and the religion are not separate. They're not separate things. No, so I, get he, I get that. When, was... when he says the Ophites are terrible because they drink semen, right? Um, it's not out of context in antiquity. Check out the PGM. It's I get in the that. PGM. So I what do we that. do? But here's the thing: if the Ophites are doing that and they're down with that, why would they wouldn't it wouldn't be a refutation against? They wouldn't be Christians at that point. They'd be something else, don't you think? They'd be Ophites who were following right. the serpent. Yeah. So then I think you have to draw a line at some point where it becomes that, or it's Christianity getting getting accused of something that Ophites are doing. You know what I mean? Yeah, right. But the Ophites have nobody calls them Christians, right? The Ophites have a Christos. Right. And it's a female. So the word people, one of your questions at the beginning of the show was uh, what sort of elements, Greek elements are there in Christianity? Let me just say one thing. The language is pagan Greek. The thing that they're transmitting, they're using Greek titles for everything. Christ, Greek title, savior, Greek object, uh, gospel, Greek idea. So what do well, yeah, is pagan influencing it? Yeah, paganism is Christianity, right? It's a mystery. Everybody says Christianity is a mystery, right? Why do you call it a mystery? You only call it a mystery because they called musteria those religions that did certain initiations. And Christianity was one of them, like baptism, a Greek word. Christianity I mean, is paganism. In, I don't in know. Eastern in Eastern Orthodoxy, I'm a Actually, from that side, I went to an ex in Eastern Orthodox seminary as younger, and like in Eastern Orthodoxy, the sacraments, what Catholics call the sacraments, are called the mysteries till right. today. Like, yeah, because that's what it is. That's what. I was, but I don't know if the mist, if it, if it's a mystery religion, doesn't necessarily make it pagan though. Because I think paganism is a certain thing where we're talking about like traditional Homeric theology. That's what I call paganism. But I think even even something like Platonism doesn't necessarily have to be paganism. Like Plato himself in, in the Republic is like, we need to replace Homer. Homer makes does this and does that, and I don't like this, and I don't like that. I think you can make an argument that Christianity coming out of Judaism and a real grassroots movement in a time period where the world was Hellenized or the Roman Empire was Hellenized and also heavily influenced by Middle Platonism, which was the rage of the day. To me, that's what makes sense. It's a natural evolution out of that through this real grassroots movement led by a guy named Jesus. It's not, I don't, it doesn't have to be complicated. It doesn't have to be mysterious. It doesn't have to be secret code. It doesn't have to be some emperor invented it behind the scenes. It doesn't have to be none of that. It just is what it is. Like, there's really nothing we need to add to the story that we don't already know. You know what I mean? Yeah, somebody just has to be resurrected and be the Christ. I get it. Yeah, no, somebody's got to be the Bacchus, right? I get it. Yeah. Oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah, you could definitely see the um, – I, I agree with that. I definitely think there's some elements of – because he's, he's the son of God. So the son of God – even Justin Martyr points it out. You know, this what you call sons of Jupiter, you know, this is no different, than blah, blah, blah. Basically saying, like, look, look this this these ideas – are, and, and Eusebius echoes this too. These ideas have been passed down from Pythagoras, the Orphics, uh, uh, Plato, blah, 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 you know, and Philo. So well, this is not nothing new nor crazy. And they're making that argument. And I think that's true. But that doesn't mean it's paganism either. I don't, I wouldn't call it paganism. I would just say it's, you know, it's Hellenized Judaism. You know? But. I will say, I think there's some influences happening in, from the pagan world. Because like, like you mentioned, I'm on, this is Greek. This is a Greek-speaking world. The words in Greek come from Homeric poetry, Orphic hymns, that stuff. You, you can't escape it. Just using the words themselves, it's going to be by default entering the, entering the passages. Yeah, you know by, I mean? yeah, by the time Jesus is around calling himself the Savior, or other people are calling him the Savior... They've been using that term for hundreds, hundreds of yeah. years. Demetrius the Soter, yeah. Antiochus the Soter. You have all these different Soters. And those are recent ones. Within the religion, you've got some back in the 6th century, 5th century, where you have the Sotera, the female the female savior, right? So, yeah, yeah. You can't – Christianity didn't come into the world without any background, right? It comes with a lot of baggage to it. 
I um, mean, Neil? Derek. Oh. Derek interviewed uh, John Crossan, the Jesus Seminar scholar. He has an interesting point. Like when you compare the coins, that a bunch of terms used for Jesus were used for emperors, like Son of yeah. God, Savior, etc. Exactly. It's like it's like in the in the music industry or the film industry or whatever it is. If ideas are going are going to um, pass through from 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 subject to subject, from film to film, from song to song. It doesn't mean they're like going out of their way and like trying to um, copy and rip from that. It just means that that's what they're here. That's what that's what's around them. That's what that's influencing them, even if it's subconsciously, even if they're not even realizing it. It's just that's how all culture is. It's an evolution. When, when uh, Cyrus the Great welcomed the Jews back into the Holy Land, uh, they were they were Persian. And so now you have the Jews like back in their home that's inhabited by Persians. So that's where in their primary religion is Zoroastrianism. So then we start seeing like concepts about this devil more clearly defined. Yeah. Heaven and hell start here because they're, they're being influenced. Absolutely. I don't know what Pokemon that is, son. Onyx. That's an Onyx. Hey, there. He's opening Pokemon cards. <laughs> yep. It evolves into Steelix. It does. Yeah. But you know what though? The, the not seen preacher, I'll never, to me, this is the, that is the gold. That is the diamond in the rough where this Nassim preacher is literally saying, look, guys, when they thought when Egypt, when Egypt thought Osiris was the was the God that what they really were uh, experiencing was Jesus. When the Phrygians had uh, Adonis or uh, Attis or whatever, that was Jesus or the player of the pipes who's pan, by the way, who literally looks like a devil. He's got horns. He looks like a goat. The player of the pipes. That was Jesus. He's naming off all these gods and identifying them as, you know, types of Jesuses. This, the same way Hebrews is talking about Melchizedek. Now I get now Caleb's like, yeah, that's some heresy shit. I get that. It is, it is later condemned as heresy, but it shows you the time period, the second century, that there were ideas like that. There was varieties of Christianity that were extending as far as someone like the Nassim preacher who was coming out. And he was very popular, by the way. And he's coming out and making these claims that are interesting, I think. Yeah, certainly they're interesting. But I mean, that's I think that's how you communicate with people and sell a message. I think if you had a message that was just so unrelatable that people just couldn't even understand basic concepts of, then it wouldn't get very far. I think you have to use analogies yeah. people are familiar. I mean, even Jesus during his parables would use farming analogies, fishing analogies, stuff that would make sense with his audience. So it doesn't overly surprise me that getting a message across that you want to be successful you have to make analogies to things and parallel things that would have been pretty fairly understood in that culture you know paul does that with the unknown uh the statue the idol to the unknown uh god i think right so yeah, yeah certainly certainly you have to make a, a basin for and to make parallels and to pick creatures and and other mythologies to and the carbon equations carbon equations in egypt where um they had in in their temple or whatever it was, temple or church, whatever it was, they had a st they were the first people to have an image of Jesus, according to I'm um, David Litwa, and according to like our sources, like we as of, as of what we know, we we haven't found in any earlier Christian right. groups. He doesn't have a beard in that one either, does he? I don't think he does. I'm not sure, and I, I don't I don't even know if we have the depiction anymore. I think we lost it. But anyways, and Jesus is in the middle, and on both sides of Jesus, you have Pythagoras and Plato. Mm -hmm. It's not Moses and Elijah in Jesus. It's Pythagoras, Plato, and Jesus. That is interesting. That to me is fascinating because it shows you that Christ and like it, it, it um it strengthens my point that I just made five minutes ago. This is a movement coming out of Judaism that's heavily influenced by the Middle Platonism of the day. You know, even if it's wrong, even if it's heresy, later right. condemned by later church members, it still was happening. No, they did it religiously, but later you have church fathers doing that philosophically, like uh, saying that Plato learned most of his stuff from, from Moses, like yeah, that he's he's the Moses of the Greeks and stuff, stuff like that. Like, yep, exactly. Yeah, this is that is exactly what he says. He goes, "What is Plato but uh, but a Hellenized Moses?" That's what Philo says. You know. 
do you think there's a possibility that Christianity could be one of those theological cosmological inversions like Zoroastrianism was for the uh, like the Hindus, where the Hindu gods became the demons in Zoroastrianism? And that's kind of it's like they kept the pagan trappings, but they basically inverted it on a a, like a theological level. What do you think? Possible. I'd say kind of. Yeah. When you when you read about like in the book of Daniel, when the uh, the um, the Asherah poles removed from the temple of Yahweh and the prophets of Baal are chased out and killed and all that. The reason they did that is because um, they started thinking that uh, worshiping these other gods was uh, upsetting the one true God, Yahweh. So they started like, we need to remove those out. And then it started, they started thinking that you became like influenced by these other gods. If you weren't worshiping Yahweh right or hard enough, you were, you were being influenced by them. And then that became like you were possessed by them and then they became demons. So you see how this idea of like you being controlled by these other, other gods, then they became lesser gods, then they became demons. uh, And they were, you know, first influencing you and then they were possessing you and then they were controlling you. And then, so yeah, that's kind of how that idea, I think there's a good case to be made there. No, but there, there's a direct inversion in Gnostics. Like they explicitly say that the Jewish God is the devil, like basically. Well, not only that, so some of the Gnostic, the Nagamati texts had like Eros popping up as an angel, who's the God of love in the Greek mythology. So there is some sort of like trickle down effect with some, some of these deities, you know? Martian, Martian believed that there was two separate gods. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Didn't these sons of God see the daughters of men and they were like, wow, we ought to go teach these ladies magic? That's Enoch. Enoch yeah. yeah. Isn't yeah. there, the could watchers. you say, could you say an answer to that question? Could you say they weren't just flipped? The, go, the gods weren't made into demons. They're kind of, they kind of integrated within the human race and we get all these magi and these, you know, freaky That's demons. People, say, yeah. people. Yeah. I don't know. Constellation Pegasus, super chat. Go to Kabad.org and read the Rashi commentary in Exodus 4.24 to the audience and let us know what you think of the serpent. Who? Anyone want to pull that up? No? Snakes and Moses, anyone? That's all you. Um, you're the one who was all yeah. over that one. You know, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna pull that up because I'm not, not, work, I'm not a Kabad Just Moses guy. turning the rod into a snake. Oh, that's the okay, circle. that's what he's probably talking about. Exodus yeah. 4. Let me just pull it up real quick. Exodus. 424 it is yeah it's the verse of moses and his family are traveling in egypt and they stopped the refreshment of cattle uh moses sir oh this is the same is, what is he talking i don't see any serpents in here okay i don't know <laughs> i don't know i'm probably pulling something up wrong or something i don't know but anyways yeah there is a lot of serpent stuff happening in the book of exodus though with the putting it on the rod because they're they're all getting bit by serpents and he as, and then the New Testament writers come along and say, as Moses raised up the serpent, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. So there's that su- su- serpent symbolism right there. You know what I mean? So it's the it looks like it's the verse that talks about God going to kill Moses, right? He's, he's angry at him. He's, he's going to kill him. What is he doing? Maybe the people at Chabad think it has something to do with the fact that he was throwing around snakes or something. What is it? Let me just throw this question out there. What is it with snakes in these mystery religions? I mean, the Jews go into their tent and they 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 have the voice of God that speaks to them through the pillar of smoke and everything, and it's oracular and it just it just smacks the Greeks translated as telesterian, right? It's the it's that place where you meet God. Right? If I could interject quickly. Could, 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 I'm sorry, say again. I was just gonna say if I can interject quickly. By the way, thanks for having me on, fellas. My name is Pocket Locker 86. Uh, y'all catch me at Pocket Locker 86 everywhere. Huge fan of, of the panel here. But um, I think they're just tapping into that evolutionary thing that I always call very simply monkeys fear snakes, right? And that's just like I think deep in us. I even think like about um, like snake pet people, right? Part of the allure for them of having pet snakes, right, is that that's the thing that drives you crazy. And it's, it's, like, a, it's like a test if you're even going to be comfortable coming to that person's house because they got a pet snake. And you, right, a lot of us aren't. But I think they're tapping into that. And that's why you find it as a, a common theme is that that fear of snake that's so deep in us. But that's just my two cents. I'm on. Where's your dude, I've been keep, dude, where's dude, your I've been keeping, dude, I've been keeping snakes for four years. Just Go like a simple... Priestesses, and I'll tell you what, there's nothing about it that has to do with fear. 
Nothing about it has to do with fear. Well, you I, don't fear it. You yeah. don't fear them. No, but and other, other people don't too because they see how I react with a snake and the snake reacts with me. Go get them. Go get them. Go, okay. <laughs> But what it, do you guys it, think it is as a, as a common theme, though? What do you guys? Why do you guys think it's the theme in the, the the text? That's what we're asking, right? Not his personal experience, but like, right. why is it keep? Why is it a recurring theme in the scriptures? I no, guess it's actually they put them together with the scorpions because those are the critters on, are on the ground, the little lowly creature. There's a, there's coins you can find the a coins of ancient Canaanite like uh, religious images of snakes with wings that are basically taken from ancient Egypt and. That's where the what's the Hebrew word dofanim, like the biting ones of the or the fiery ones, or like the the type yeah. of angels that that guard the throne and the tree. Yeah, the they're ac they're mm -hmm. actually snakes with wings. You can literally Google and find images of those coins. Like, yeah. Oh, by the way, uh, did OPUs. did someone? Sorry, sorry, did someone pull up this text? I pulled it up. If I, if you want, there's yeah, yeah. You could share your screen. Uh, you know, on the uh, uh, that's too complicated for me. I don't know what. This is Ophiuchus, though, real quick. Ophiuchus is the serpent bear, and he stands on he stands on scorpions. I don't know. Some people have some people have pointed out that maybe when Jesus says, "I'll give you the power to tread on serpents and scorpions," and uh, you know, Ophiuchus is basically a Greek version of a the healer. They're saying maybe there's some sort of astrotheology thing going on. I don't know. I'm just I'm just throwing stuff throwing ideas out there. I'm not sure if you can prove that, but. It's interesting, but go ahead. Read it. Yeah, read it. So, 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 to be as, as wise as a serpent or as cunning as a serpent. Yeah. So, so like the verse 24 of Exodus, like chapter four is now he was on the way in an inn, like a tavern that the Lord met him and sought to put him to death. And like, that's the entire verse. And the Rashi comments it and says he sought Moses, like God sought Moses because he had neglected to circumcise his son Eliezer. And now the commentary goes for a bit and then ends with this sentence. The angel turned into a sort of serpent and swallowed him, Moses, from head to his thighs. Wow. And then spit him out and then again swallowed him from his feet to his private parts. Wow. Zipporah therefore understood that it was because of the failure to perform the circumcision that this happened. <laughs> what, wow. what is going on here? Like, what, what does mean? that mean? <laughs> I don't know. When I hear claims like that, though, my first reaction is: so now when somebody doesn't get circumcised and doesn't, they don't get swallowed by a serpent, doesn't that look kind of sketch? That you're like you're claiming that oh he didn't get circumcised, so he got swallowed by a serpent. You know what I mean? Yeah, are we I mean, supposed to conclude that that Moses gives snakes indigestion? <laughs> yes. Yeah. yeah. What? Yeah. What do you have though? Because you have this as a theme in antiquity of getting swallowed. You even sh you even flashed up a pot, Neil, um, that has Jason getting swallowed by the serpent. Oh yeah, yeah, I saw that. Regurgitated. Yeah. There's something about this getting swallowed and regurgitated. Jason that, means healer too. It's Greece. culty. That's culty. I, I'm wondering what it is. Yeah. There's there's also a strong uh, pattern, sort of an archetypal snakes versus birds sort of thing. Here know, it like is. On the flag image. of Mexico. And it, it's across like all cultures. And it's sort of like the lowly ground ones versus the noble sky dwellers. I also wonder how much of it's like a scale thing. Um, I always think that like if uh, insects who happen to be like a lot smaller than us, right? A lot of times were like, like say like a lot bigger than us, like 400 pounds, right? They look like monsters to us, right? Like just these scary, awful things, right? And so I think the same way we see like smaller forms of life, like we'll see a scorpion or something like gobble up a mouse or something. And, and then we're kind of like imagining that, like, and it becomes this fantastic terror like it's oh it's kind of like being jobbled up in the gauze of a you know and i don't know i just think that that's uh it taps into part of our primal imagination or something i don't know but it is it is such a cool thing to wonder about like where we get the you know sort of consistent response to these type of stories from yeah for real and look this is from the argonautica jason getting swallowed up by and spit out by a serpent and there's um yeah, see that creeps me out. Like I feel that. Do y'all feel that? Like yeah. just, uh, just yeah. For sure. 
What's it doing though? Because he's getting swallowed and spit out just like Moses is. What what do you have to do to get swallowed and spit up by a by a giant serpent? A lot of the early commentaries on um I don't want to sound racist, but this is why black people don't go hiking like that. I'm just I'm just putting it out there. I'm just a lot of the commentaries on um uh what's his name of Rhodes that wrote the Argonautica. What's his name again? Amon Apollonius of Rhodes. Apollonius of Rhodes, yeah. That he would th that this is the real root of the mysteries was this myth, the Argonautica. Like this was the most like sacred myth of all. And Jason is his name actually means healer too. Jason in Greek. And I don't know. Yeah, that's my name. Yeah. It's a good name. Thanks. Um, but uh Dr. Uh oh come on, I can't think of his name right now. You're your 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 guy, uh I'm on that you that to who you're learning from, uh who does the the uh, Demeter stuff. Yeah, Dr. Carl Ruck from Boston. Carl Ruck, Ruck, yeah. He points out there's a lot of a lot of commonality between the Argonautica and stuff that's in the not just the New Testament, but Old Testament too. There's a lot of uh, commonality happening. Yeah, and you can't deny that Medea was herself a Georgian queen in the late Bronze Age. So she's roughly contemporary with Moses. So yeah. a lot of a, a lot of the oracular religion stuff that's going on overlaps. And Dr. Ruck is quick to point out. Um, that you really have to consider the phallic imagery when you're talking about when you're talking about the servant. The same word in, in, in Greek for it says when the when the when, when the devil brought down the third of the host with him. Um, um, it says it's his tail, but that's pale. It's also a penis. So are these sons of God? Are these sons of God that we're talking? About? Are we back to Enoch and Alexandrian stuff? Yeah, it's brilliant, brilliant. I love the love the snakes. It's all over the place, right? And the Greeks. I think Ophiuchus is a he was he. People don't realize there was a thirteenth constellation for a long time. That was and this was Ophiuchus, and he's depicted as holding the serpent. He's a healer, okay, just like Jason, just like Moses, or he's a healer. He's the he's the Greek version of Asclepius, or a, a former Greek version of Asclepius, I guess. And uh, I don't. It's interesting. You get verses like this. I behold, I give you power to tread on serpents and scorpions. I got. Like, maybe there's some influence going on. Maybe they're. You know what do you? I don't know. Just saying. Just saying. Especially since the first century was rife with what they call antidote uh, publishers, right? And people who are publishing works on poisonous animals and antidotes and what to do about them. And yeah, uh, Paul gets bit by uh, this yeah. snake and he's fine. Right, he's fine. He's got no problem. Right, should have killed him. Everybody was shocked, like what? Right, but it should have yeah. killed him, but it didn't. So why is Paul got? Why is Paul got immunity to to viper venom? I don't know. Is he doing? It? You can buy viper venom, by the way, guys, in the Roman marketplace. You can snort the stuff. You can put it into a wine and and put it in your orifices. You know what I mean? So they describe people coming out of the taverna, totally wasted on this stuff, and they say, "What do you do for?" this set of drugs right that's connected with this religion and the pharmacologist there was a roman physician who writes a book whole book on what to do about drugs and overdoses and what do you do when somebody comes out and they're all crazy and psyched out you know Galen so has, it, Galen it's good stuff. Stuff. no his name is scribonius i guarantee you nobody nobody's ever here heard of scribonius i think i've heard of scribonius but yeah, that's it's from galen is that sort of one of galen sources yeah yeah because yeah, galen is later yeah yeah good yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, Hunter Biden's laptop says "Drive safely, Derek." Thank you. Interesting name, by the way. <laughs> by the way, guys, that's me. <laughs> that was you. Yeah, yeah. Oh. Pocket Locker eighty six. Hunter Biden's laptops. Jay Bundy and the uh, Casino Theater and Arcade Management are all the same person. Uh, but yeah, that's my right wing troll account. It's do you guys you guys see that account, Mister Hillary's emails? No, I hadn't seen it. Yeah, it's my Mr. Hillary's emails account. It's like his and her conspiracy theory accounts. Nice, nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks for the shout out, though. Yeah, drive safely, Derek. Uh, get to your destination in good health, and uh, give me a call if you're bored on the road, bro. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So, yeah, I don't know. We're talking about some interesting stuff, um, but uh, yeah. Anyone want to have anything want to add? Got twenty minutes left. Were y'all earlier talking about the uh, snakes, correct? Yeah. So, 
I've there is a commentary, well, not a commentary, but like a digital talk, like a podcast. You know, uh, I've heard that there's not one snake, but two snakes. You know, one snake is supposed to to represent healing. I forgot which part of Exodus. You know, they make a pole and the snake, and you're supposed to look at it and get healed, right? So. That's why perhaps a Hermes staff is intertwined, one for healing and the other one for death. As oh, yeah, the her the, the uh, what is that? What is that staff called again? The, the her staff of Hermes. Caduceus. Yeah, yeah, Caduceus. Yeah. The Caduceus. The Caduceus. Yes, yeah, exactly. Caduceus. Why is it? Why is it looking like a mirror? Why is there two of them? Is, anyone, is there a reason uh, like that? Because that's what how snakes mate. Oh, in wow. in in ancient Egypt, the goddess of knowledge and of writing, uh, I think it's Seshet, or just Google goddess of knowledge, ancient Egypt. She has a symbol on top of her head that is uh, a palm tree, which is used to make like papyrus, I think, and two snakes that look at each other, like they're talking uh -huh. or something. Like. Is that um, Gnosis? I think it's a bad idea to... Um, insert modern knowledge into ancient myths. I, I don't think that that the fact that they something resembles something means that that's what those people thought. Sure, have a middle opinion. You know, certain modern ideas, you know, could actually be you know translated into ancient ideas because of the culture, the context that stood there. You know, for example. Uh, there's not a bunch of things today, but there's a few things, perhaps. Oh, the staff is only one snake with a wing. No, that's two. That's two. It's two yeah, snakes? That's, that's two. That's two. I see two you know, hats. I noticed that the symbol of health in modern times looks a lot like that. Oh, I had trouble looking at the wings. I don't know if it's a wing or an eagle. No, two wings. Those look like wings. He should have a winged sun at the top of the staff. Oh, is right. that is that is that Mercury? Yes. Yeah, or Hermes. Hermes is Mercury. Mercury is the Roman version. One of the explanations for s the symbolism that I had always heard that resonated with me was the analogy with Kundalini rising, and the the, the central column being the the, the 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 main column up the spine and the, the, the spirals around the outside and it's usually seven seven twinings which correspond one for each um of the chakras and the idea is that the kundalini rises and the the wings are a symbol of the consciousness enlightenment you get when you transcend the kundalini that's one of the uh explanations that that i had heard that uh resonated pretty well with me why are they always associated with wisdom? Why is that so cross-cultural? Anybody have any ideas on that? Snakes and wisdom? No, they just thought they were magic because they shed their skin. Come on, dude. Yeah. You think they're really that dumb? Yeah. Why is it ser why is it serpents? <laughs> there you see well, that's, a, that's a phrase. Why is it serpents? You know? Because my they, just, they now, shed their skin. Look, 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 look at this. Oh, day. Oh, 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 there's some beautiful Greek. Neil, read that Greek and oh, show everybody oh, how to Ode office and ophanomatotos panton ton therion ten epites guess. Now, the serion is a beast. Now, the serpent was the most crafty of all the brutes on the earth. Yes. Why is he doing the Septuagint and not the original Hebrew? Oh, that's a debate right there. Which one is the original? I'm going to look at... I was getting ready. I'm going to get ready to answer that. I'm going to get ready to answer that. I'm on the Russell Gomerkin. Uh, much the line with Russell Gomerkin. He thinks that the Greek... Why is he doing the Septuagint? Because it's colloquial Greek, just like just like Julius Africanus said. And that's what it's originally written in. Our yeah, it was written in, written in Koine, it was written in Koine Greek. So you think that there? Were, you think there was no Hebrew, even even um, singular scrolls in circulation before the Greek came out? I do. No, the 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 Hebrew the Hebrew um, uh, texts were written in Hebrew. Yeah. The New Testament texts were written in in, in Koine Greek. 
Oh, yeah. no, so in the, in the third third century BCE, even only maybe even the fourth century BCE. No, it's the third century. I'm sorry, late third century BCE. You get the Greek Septuagint, which is the Old Testament, and a lot of people think that at that point in time there wasn't really a lot going on. Maybe there was a five books of Moses, maybe something like that, and then maybe some the prophets had their singular scrolls written in circulation. But a lot of people think that there was they didn't have it all in one spot yet. It was the, it was a Greek idea. The Septuagint was gave the idea of putting it all in one place, making a Bible, biblioteca. Yeah, if it weren't for all the colloquial Greek expressions, like just from the very beginning, like that one that you just put up there, just use that verse that you put up there. It doesn't say he was the wisest. It doesn't say he was sophistotatos. It says he was frain. He had the most frain. Frainimotatos. Look up frain. It's a Greek concept. It's the combination of the heart and the will. Now, you unless you had 70 translators magically magically come up with the same greek philosophy yeah, um but, yeah but here's, the thing, telling this whole story. here's the thing in the genesis in the hebrew there's the you have the you have the same um same sequence with heaven and earth but then you have the two waters that are split and that you can see in the sumerian myth with um tiamat and so it, it would to me it'd be a crazy almost a miracle coincidence if you translated this from Greek and then it happens to line up with the Sumerian myth too. I think they're the Sumerian myth is first the, then the Hebrew. Then I think the Greeks had their own thing going on, but I also think Daniel and Greek was first before the Hebrew and Greek. So I think there's a little bit of both going on. Cause you can't argue against Daniel being colloquial. No, Daniel's, Greek. Greek. Yeah. Daniel's a Greek text. There, it's all Greek idioms. I've looked into this myself. I, I saw the, that that's a fact, but the, there's other parts. Most of the old Testament, I think was mostly Hebrew first. I'm not, I'm not had some Aramaic in it as well. Exactly. The Aramaic too. Yeah. I'm yeah. not sold by Russell Gomerkin, but I think Russell Gomerkin's, you know, I think he's making good points. I think he's on to something, but I don't think he's entirely right. Any, let me give you, let me give you an in any classicist who has been trained to the PhD level in classical Greek reads the Septuagint saying, there's no way this is a translation. There's no way it's a translation. They're using native Greek concepts. So, um, yeah, it's remember the Masoretes didn't come along until like the ninth and tenth century, right? AD, because they had to have a standard Hebrew text. We today, thanks to the Protestant tradition, just accept the fact that this 10th century Hebrew predates the third, second century Greek, right? BC. And that's just historically wrong. Like somebody came on, Neil, and they were talking about the Hebrew, the the, the Hebrew overlap with the word for a uh, uh, serpent right now it's being the hebrew word for serpent being now the temple in greek temple now but if you if you that's know where Naos, if you preacher. know where now came from you know it's mycenaean and it predates the earliest proto hebrew by about 800 years so what's that doing there that's not hebrew right wow that's messed I've up i've never heard a scholar say the old testament was originally greek i've no, never no. heard that yeah i've heard you, no you need, rabbi you, say that. That. Like, you need to watch gomerkin well, you need to watch gomerkin yeah the pentateuch was written in hebrew Gmer gomerkin got got um got oh what's it called he got uh, i was captain dadpool i was 100 percent with you but gomerkin presents an argument that i just i can't dismiss out of are hand there, are there other scholars he got peer reviewed he got peer reviewed. 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 reviewed yeah no no his his, his stuff is is it's it's eye-opening well yeah, i don't think people it, cite one scholar that makes me very nervous if you can cite no, like I, a plethora of different peer-reviewed ones but whenever oh, no 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 I, I understand what you're saying i'm not familiar enough with the field of uh biblical scholarship i'm just, I'm just hoping it's not the the richard carrier of the old testament is all i'm saying no and that, and i don't even think he's entirely right about everything i think he's on to i think there's there's some truth to what he's saying but he's unearthed think, a lot of stuff that needs more examination it doesn't make sense to me that there wouldn't be hebrew scrolls in in their own language before the septuagint it just doesn't make sense now there is the whole herodotus is like writing about all the lands in the fifth century BCE. No mention of Israel. What does that tell me? Does it say Israel didn't exist? No, we already have the Manetta Steli, so we already know they exist. They already mentioned way before that. But what it does tell us is that probably was just a small city state. Probably wasn't a big country with a huge kingdom and a huge. Probably wasn't that big of a deal up until probably the fifth, fourth century BCE is when they finally became Israel. Israel. 
That's I did have a quick question on the. I had a quick question on the Book of Daniel. Do you think it's fair to consider it a Hellenistic, millennia later reboot of uh, the Ugaritic Daniel? Oh, because he was okay. Because I think it's a just, different Dan Daniel. It's just date date like it's different. I was just curious if they just rebooted the character, sort of re you know just re brought him back up again, and and you know to to give the uh, religion you know the the you know anticity oh, and, and you know, I don't know why that, that means judge. The, the word Dan means judge in, you know, Hebrew or any oh. Semitic language. So that's probably I, where the Dan comes from. Where's the drag? Where's the dragon come from in Daniel? I don't the know. dragon that would that that comes from uh, Marduk. That comes from Bel. Nice, nice. More serpents. Why do we have the, all these serpents all over the place? Because serpents are magic. Exactly. What do you mean, magic? You can die right. and resurrect. Explain okay, what yeah, you mean, they, magic. They shed their skin, so they symbolize uh, resurrection. That's true. That I'm sorry, but that's that's. Come on, man. When you have a temple in Athens and you got it full of snakes, are you telling me you're basing everything on the the miracle of their shedding their skin? That I, oh, Aristotle just rolled over in his grave. Well, right. I mean, why don't we call? Why don't we just worship the bees then for their, for their buzzing? I mean, come on, guys, really? It, why isn't it not the venoms? They're well, using the venoms also, in their medicine. It's probably also a phallic symbolization too. They have they're sort of a phallic symbol. And what about the venoms? What about the venoms? Are they using the venoms? If they're using the venoms, why? And is that why snakes are so important? There's a famous sculpture. Of Hygieia, I think it's Hygieia. With yeah, little so it's probably it's probably death and rebirth. So the venom would be death, and the rebirth is the fact that they shed their skin. Exactly, um, and I can yeah. with the super chat. Exactly, says. exactly, Listen. and I can and I can put a venom on a rod, and I can insert it rectally and get you to enter that death experience. No, I'm totally serious. No, I'm I to, that, it's um, called oysters. There's, it's there's called a oysters. large number of things you could do to get me to experience death. Yes. That's All right, we got super chat, guys. Vesper, thank you for the super chat. Wasn't Jesus in a scene? Who are a no Anakian Kabbalist? Well, Kabbalism doesn't come till way later, so I don't know about that. Mm -hmm. But him being in a scene is possible. I don't know if you can say for sure it's possible. Weren't the Essenes the ones who wrote the Gnostic Bible? No. The Gnostic text? No. The Dead Sea Scrolls. The Essenes are one of the major Dead three. Dead Sea Scrolls. Scrolls. I'm sorry. Dead yeah, Dead yeah. Okay, okay, yeah. But the, it's not entirely – it doesn't mean this. the Qumran community doesn't necessarily equal Essenes, but they could be yeah. some sort of a subsect. This is, this is, I got this from uh, James – Table. So could you say that the the what the the teacher isn't the teacher sort of from the um, Dead Sea Scrolls tended to be is thought of as sort of like a precursor, a liter a, a literary precursor to Jesus, so or mm -hmm. meaning that it, he has some of the concepts that we would later find in Jesus, right? No, when know. you look, I'm asking, I'm asking. I don't know if we because they don't really say much about him, but except for a couple of things, I, I, mean, I don't know. You I can do a, you can do like a, a parallelism, like in, and claim that Jesus is an Essene based on the teachings, because like when you compare the Old Testament ethics with the ethics that Jesus preaches, which are often like at odds, you yeah. can see that the 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 ethics that Jesus preached is identical to the one that Josephus and Philo ascribed to Essenes. Like, so the opposition to wealth and like uh, communal living and uh, opposition to sacrifices. There's a lot in common, but there's also, stuff like that. there's also some problems with that too. Because if you read what Josephus says about the Essenes, he says that the Essenes are more stricter about Sabbath than any other sect. And, and, uh, and you got Jesus saying, if you have an animal fall into a fall into a ditch aren't you going to get him out well in the Dead Sea scrolls there's a law that says if your animal falls into a ditch don't even grab it they literally but have the opposite the, this is that. this is a like the 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 interesting verse when Jesus tells um, the Jews that they don't know the law but like he at one point says that uh, he's here to fulfill the law he's not going to like remove one yacht of the law or like 
right. the Hebrew equivalent of a yotta. And then he goes uh, on to contradict various Old Testament laws, like about the Shabbat and whatever. Uh, exactly. Uh, an interesting solution to that is to claim that Jesus was part of an Essene group that had an, alter an alternative law. So, like, he wants to uphold that alternative law, but yeah. not the one that we find in the official scriptures used by Sadducees and the Pharisees. And this is not like a claim uh, out of whole cloth, because you have Epiphanius in his Panarion mentioning that there are various Jewish groups who had different Torahs. Yeah. And he says some of them, for example, he gives an example of one group that rejected animal sacrifices. They said, God never commented animal sacrifices. We don't, we reject the temple, we reject the animal sacrifices, we are vegetarian. And like, that's a historical source mentioning such an, alter an alternative view among the Jews. Yeah. So like, it could be a possibility that Jesus came out from such a group. Like, or nice to point add, to add to what you just said because i think that makes a lot of sense to add to what you said and go even farther with that it's a possibility the reason why he mentions the animal falling into a ditch is because he's part of that group and he's contesting that law he's looking at that law because he's right there which means he could be in that group it doesn't mean just because you're part of a group that you agree with everything that group does you he might have felt differently about that law and if he's high up if he's the leader of this group He's the only one who's going to be able to change these type of things. So that could explain that could explain why he completely turns it on its head. There's also another argument for that, like uh, a view. It's kind of tenuous, but like it's uh, one of the interpretations of the name a scene is that it comes from a Hebrew word chased, which means compassion or mercy. And yeah. like uh, it's the word used in uh, Hosea when he says that God says. I want mercy, not sacrifice. Right. And Jesus is said in the Gospels to quote that verse from Hosea on two different occasions. So probably on several different occasions, like opposing sacrifice and wanting mercy. Like, yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, There's a lot of good points there. Constellation Pegasus with a $20 super chat. What about black cats in the first and second temple periods? Any magic or bad things associated with them? The Babylonian Talmud has some weird stuff about burning black cat guts, <laughs> rubbing them in the eyes to see demons. Wow. That's interesting. What do you think? Amon probably knows about that one. Yeah, about burning cats. No, I know about no, I know about other things in cats, but not burning. <laughs> um you you uh the association tends to be with the Greeks tends to be later with the power of the cats. And I think they're only adopting it through the I think they're only getting it through the Egyptians. Yeah, I don't think. I, yeah, um, but they're the first ones to actually uh, domesticate cats. But what are those cats doing for the Egyptians? Because I mean, this is a good question. You know, any magic or bad things associated with them? Yeah, you know, I'm wondering as the Jews are in Alexandria and they're like, what's with all this cat worship stuff? And people are embalming these things, and yeah, yeah, worshiping their animals. What is that? Yeah, that, I think that's a great question. Definitely weird, though. No, actually, Talmud, like, I've seen some Derek's interviews with scholars about the Old Testament, like, when they respond to Christian apologists, and, like, uh, th there was recently an episode with the, God, forgot the name, the guy from Digital Hammurabi. Yeah, Jack Josh. Uh, uh, he was talking about the violence in the Old Testament and how Christian apologists answer, like, questions about that. But it's, like... Uh, Talmud is actually pretty interesting for answering such questions, and that's not often talked about, like with regards to Old Testament violence and and uh, ap apologism uh, around it. Because like Jews has have the entire concept of the Oral Torah, like there's an entire set of things that God told Moses that didn't get written in the Torah, but were like passed down orally and then they got written down only in the first century in the Mishnah which is the core of the Talmud and they have a bunch of stuff there like this interestingly they solve most of the violent stuff like they have like various uh, kind of reminds of Islamic like law they have various rules on uh, witnesses and how to conduct uh, court proceedings and like 
the those rules there are basically uh, not explicitly, but very obviously deliberately made to avoid um, any of the bad laws, like in the in the in the Old Testament, like the capital punishment for trivial stuff, like collecting woods on on Sabbath. Like they they literally make it impossible to do a capital punishment. Yeah, like yeah. it's some weird like a bunch of rules that where you have to have like two witnesses for a violation that is a capital offense according to the Torah and those witnesses have to be pious Jews and they have right. to be there while you commit the crime and they have to tell you oh hey you you are committing a crime that is a capital offense according to the Torah and if you don't stop we will have to kill you and then you have to respond oh I know and I want to continue like and then they get you to court and maybe then they can do a capital punishment like and if you lose and you get caught and you get hit with a false false witness somehow because those people that you're accusing are going to be pissed they're going to say it's a false false witness now you're screwed so the little guy in the situation whoever it is a female who gets raped something like that someone who's not an elite someone who's poor they have no bargaining in this situation whatsoever one They're of cool. the worst one of the worst old testament laws is marry a rapist law like yeah, if, a, if, exactly. a, if a woman is raped she has to marry a rapist and actually the jews uh kind of solved that through oral torah not really yeah. but kind of because they define marriage as obligation of a man towards a woman but not of woman towards a man and like the a uh, woman has no obligations towards the husband, but the husband has an obligation to provide her with money and clothes and food. So by giving all those extra like laws and precepts, basically said, oh, it's the marry or rap rapist law is actually a punishment for the rapist so that he has to like uh, uh, help that woman materially for the rest of her life or until she divorces him. Like. Yeah. But like he doesn't have a right to have sex with her ever again, like if she doesn't want to, according to those oral Torah rules. It says if a man meets a virgin who is not betrothed and seizes her and lies with her, and they are found. The man who lay with her shall give to the father a young woman fifty shekels of silver, and she shall be his wife because he has violated her. He may not divorce her all his days. Oh wow, such a terrible deal for him. You can't divorce her. That's terrible for that guy. Doesn't that suck, right? Zeleny, did oh. I hear you right when you said uh, that you said you were former Orthodox? Yeah, yeah, I went to an Eastern Orthodox seminary. Yeah. Okay, fantastic. And can, how was your? You weren't here when they were asking about impressions of what? What was it that that kicked you out of that Orthodox mode? Was it one thing, or was it just? You know, you just sat around, you were reading Aristotle one day, and you're like, oh, you know. I mean, what no, was uh, uh, actually, I was reading Descartes. Yes. That's oh, amazing. that is awesome. <laughs> yeah. A lot of people. And then Descartes, after, people af that's why after the seminary, I went on to a different college to major in analytic philosophy. Like, <laughs> Oh, wow. Is oh, my God. So Descartes, Descartes made you an apostate? Yeah. Can I can I can I ask something here? I just find it so uh frustrating that I think like the Bible, the way we've accepted it in the culture makes it so wild that you have you, I'm sure you guys have had a lot of discussions where Christians want to talk to you and basically say, "Well, without this Bible, you know, how do you even have an objective basis for your morality to say that rape is wrong?" Like we just read this passage where it's like, "Hey homeboy, you know that girl you had a crush on in your class and you're like trying to write her notes and she just like ignores you cuz you're a dork and she doesn't like you?" Yeah, just, you know, force her real quick and then uh, you know, you have to marry her for the rest of your life. Like what a way to get your dream girl, right? Wow. And then and then and then they turn around and tell us, well, without this book, how do you even have a basis to say forced copulation is wrong? And I'm just like, all right, all right, we're done. But yeah, I just wanted to say that. Also, I've had, uh, thank you so much for having me on and uh, appreciate the opportunity. But yeah, I just wanted to throw that in there. No, it's great, great for talking by, man. Can I just put, a, put a, a, a short comment about that argument? Like the argument, how do you know about morality if you didn't have the Bible? The argument itself is a, non-christian argument it's it goes against what paul says paul says that everyone will be judged according to what they have in their hearts right. like he explicitly says that 
people who don't who did not know the law they had the law written on their hearts by exactly. god it's such a good like <laughs> like literally the bible is against that argument of like how would you know about morality without the bible yeah well paul explains it so like i also yeah. love when they they try to pull the generational fallacy like it, it was okay back then you can't use our more modern standards back then like well then the bible doesn't teach objective morality like god right. is clearly changing his moral standard along the way that's an amazing point like you like pick one pick one you can't do both that's a good point. Romans 2.14 says, Indeed, when Gentiles who do not do not have the law do by nature what the law requires, they are themselves even though they don't have the law. So they show that the work of the law is written on their hearts, their consciences also bearing witness, and their thoughts accusing and defending them. Oh, where's, where did, oh, what's, where did, uh, where did Caleb go? I want to hear what he says about that. That's a good point, dude. That's a good point. So Darwin, Darwin, what do you tell those people? Who like bring, even who even when I was a, an argument? even when I was a Christian, I would watch like debates and I would always get bothered. Like, why do these Christians keep repeating this dumb argument? How do you know morality without the Bible? Like when the Bible tells you how, like yeah. through like examination of their conscience. Yeah. Also, they they um they've already shown us what Darwin would have to Darwin have to say about this, right? Which is, you know, selfishness might have, you know, a little bit of an advantage here or there within groups, right? But cooperation wins between groups, right? And the way that they got here and maintained their nonsense by cooperating and sticking to the group script at all cost is like Darwin would be like I don't really need to say any more other than y'all just take what y'all do, do it in the mirror, and there you go. <laughs> love it. Love it. For Darwin, did they win or lose? If they won, that that that's what counts. Right. And that's the other thing. That's the thing I really can't stand as as see what I always say is you see the atheist in front of you, don't take you don't see the Christian it took to get here. I'm the Christian. Look, I played on a high school on a, a junior high school basketball team that never won a game. Right. And what you learn is that, well, we were went to, we went to a little tiny Catholic school and nobody expected us to win. We always played bigger schools. Now we took a little pride in y'all said y'all was going to beat us by 50 and you only beat us by 35. So when we have our pizza party, uh, we will be celebrating about all that shit y'all talked you didn't live up to. But at the same time, you still learn that we like this game and we're our school's basketball team. We got to show up at practice every day. We got to go through our drills. We got to play the game as best we can. And we got to shake your hands at the end of the game, say good game we lost, and we'll see you next time. Right? Now, and we also have to sign up to do this all over again next year. Now, what you learn is how to lose with dignity. You learn how to look up at the scoreboard and say, we lost this one, game's over. This is the one, this is the fatal flaw of religion. Under no circumstances can you look up at the scoreboard, say we lost, and accept defeat. And it's your fatal flaw. You just, you just can't change your mind and admit that you're wrong about this. And so those of us who are on the other side are the people who have done that work. We were on the other side. We were <laughs> so Christian. We went looking for all the answers and all the, and we just realized, oh my goodness, I think I was wrong about this. That's wow. Weird. And then we just, we just had to deal with that as hard as it was, as much of the social consequences it was, and as much as they keep trying to tell us otherwise. And so we now get it and we see this happening in front of our eyes. There's a thousand hours of tape on YouTube on these people. We all went through this graph, everyone. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Plain and simple. Yeah, thanks for letting me rant a bit, but I appreciate that. Oh, you're good, man. Oh, yeah. So I think but I think that's it for Super Chats. We've been doing this for two hours. Um, anyone else want to promote something they got going on? Oh, um, this uh, my show is Nerds and Heresy is this Sunday at or every Sunday's at 9 p.m. This Sunday, I'm supposed to be interviewing Dr. James Tabor. Oh, that's there big. You. Very congratulations good. congrats that's a big one that's a big yeah. one all right Maybe well i've got i've got tragic news um i've uh agreed to debate kent hoven on Ooh. standing for truth <laughs> on august 29th uh, monday at uh, 8 p.m eastern but i'm live every day on pocket locker 86 so uh come over check me out 
And uh, I also do overnight kind of uh, fun streams on the casino theater and arcade. So come to Pocket Locker 86. The other links are in the description. Wow, look at that. That's great. Thanks. What about you, Grandpa? What do you got going on? I got bunches of uh, you know, irons in the fire. I got some stuff that will probably be coming out uh, later on in September. Let, let everybody know. But for right now, I'll just once again quote from the Wild Stallions gospel. Be excellent to each other and party on, dudes. Awesome, awesome. And Z- Zeleni, what about you? Nothing? I just hang out? Nothing. Okay, yeah. all right. Just, just checking. And my boy Amon, I do want to give him a little bit of a I already, since i already had the tab up i was just gonna pop it up so guys go and subscribe go and subscribe to my boy. he just started a channel he's got no videos out he's got he's working on his first video hey, look he's only got 147 subscribers hit that subscribe button and uh what's up i'm on what do you got going on anything anything coming out soon yeah just the underbelly neil i'm telling i'm telling you we're bringing the underbelly and i'm bringing the deepest darkest most disgusting but informative great that you can imagine and we're going to figure out who lady babylon is there we go yeah for the classicists himself right there and philologist right that's good all right well yeah you guys know me i'm gnostic deformant and um you guys can go find me on youtube i also have a patreon page subscribe all that stuff and derek will be very happy about people who have super chats today i'm also gonna come back here i think it's either tomorrow or the next day with david fitzgerald Gonna have a conversation with David Fitzgerald. That'll be fun. So be on the lookout for that one. That's coming up. Neil, before we go, I'm a huge fan. I love your stuff. Uh, Also, I'm trying to follow after Derek. And uh, he talks about you to me all the time. He's like, Neil is the example. Neil's the guy who took what I said and has really put it to use. (laughs) And also, can we just say, Derek's been on fire lately. How is Derek getting better all the time, right? Like, for real, with the content? Yeah, he's, he's, he's really... He really is starting. He's a he's a trailblazer. He's doing like when I started when I started watching him, uh, like I I get inspired by him. Like and, and like exactly what he said is exactly true. I've been following his lead, even when it didn't seem like is that a good idea what he's telling me to do here, and I just was like you know what I'm gonna trust him. I'm, I'm watching how successful he is. I'm gonna trust, and it's working. It's working. Derek is he's he's, he's got a trail. We just gotta follow him. So if you're talking to Derek and you and he's giving you that time, take what he says for, for real. He, Derek's a good dude. He, he will not he will not see you wrong. He really is a good dude. Appreciate like, you. Appreciate he, you. Yeah, great guy. Yeah, like, great guy. Some he, people just do it because that's just how they are. Yeah. This is who they are. Yeah, yeah, not, for sure. He's not asking for money or anything. He's just he's just a good dude. He's a good hearted dude. And he's there's really not a lot of people like that. It's you know, it's I love the man. He'll just call you too. I'm like, hey man, how you doing? Yeah. Hey, hey, yeah, dude, it was weird. Yeah, I wasn't you. I wasn't ready. The first time Derek called me, I literally went. Yeah. I was just like, I, I was kind of like, huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He doesn't Crazy. text you like, hey man, you got a second? No, he just fucking calls you. Yeah. Like, oh, he cares. Man, he cares. He cares about his friends, you know. <laughs> but um, yeah, man, this has been fun. We'll do this again soon. Thank you, Neil, yeah. for the opportunity, buddy. Absolutely. And we are Myth Vision. Myth Vision. Let's go. I like this channel because I learn stuff. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I think I think Derek's influence is kind of just starting because, like I said, there's no big streamers in our community, so our platform is still like just totally undiscovered. 